Chapter 27 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27 The Story. Fair sir, said Caderousse, you must make me a promise. What is that? inquired the abbe. Why, if you ever make use of the details I am about to give you, that you will never let any one know that it was I who supplied them, for the persons of whom I am about to talk are rich and powerful, and if they only laid the tips of their fingers on me, I should break to pieces like glass. Make yourself easy, my friend, replied the abbe. I am a priest, and confessions die in my breast. Recollect, our only desire is to carry out in a fitting manner the last wishes of our friend. Speak, then, without reserve, as without hatred. Tell the truth, the whole truth. I do not know, never may know, the persons of whom you are about to speak. Besides, I am an Italian, and not a Frenchman, and belong to God, and not to man, and I shall shortly retire to my convent, which I have only quitted to fulfil the last wishes of a dying man. This positive assurance seemed to give Caderousse a little courage. Well then, under these circumstances, said Caderousse, I will, I even believe, I ought to undeceive you as to the friendship which poor Edmond thought so sincere and unquestionable. Begin with this, father, if you please, said the abbe. Edmond talked to me a great deal about the old man, for whom he had the deepest love. The history is a sad one, sir, said Caderousse, shaking his head. Perhaps you know all the earlier part of it. Yes, sir, answered the abbe. Edmond related to me everything until the moment when he was arrested in a small cabaret close to Marseille. At La Reserve, oh yes, I can see it all before me this moment. Was it not his betrothal feast? It was, and the feast that began so gaily, had a very sorrowful ending. A police commissary, followed by four soldiers, entered, and Dante was arrested. Yes, and up to this point I know all, said the priest. Dante himself only knew that which personally concerned him, for he never beheld again the five persons I have named to you, or heard mention of any one of them. Well, when Dante was arrested, Monsieur Morel hastened to obtain the particular, and they were very sad. The old man returned alone to his home, folded up his wedding suit with tears in his eyes, and paced up and down his chamber the whole day, and would not go to bed at all, for I was underneath him and heard him walking the whole night, and for myself I assure you I could not sleep either, for the grief of the poor father gave me great uneasiness, and every step he took went to my heart as really as if his foot had pressed against my breast. The next day Mercedes came to implore the protection of Monsieur de Villefort. She did not obtain it, however, and went to visit the old man, when she saw him so miserable and heartbroken, having passed a sleepless night and not touched food since the previous day, she wished him to go with her, that she might take care of him. But the old man would not consent. No, was the old man's reply. I will not leave this house, for my poor dear boy loves me better than anything in the world. And if he gets out of prison, he will come and see me the first thing. And what would he think of if I did not wait here for him? I heard all this from the window, for I was anxious that Mercedes should persuade the old man to accompany her, for his footsteps over my head night and day did not leave me a moment's repose. But did you not go upstairs and try to console the poor old man? asked the abbe. Ah, sir, replied Caderousse, we cannot console those who will not be consoled, and he was one of these. Besides, 
I know not why, but he seemed to dislike seeing me. One night, however, I heard his sobs, and I could not resist my desire to go up to him. But when I reached his door, he was no longer weeping, but praying. I cannot now repeat to you, sir, all the eloquent words and imploring language he made use of. It was more than piety. It was more than grief. And I, who am no canter and hate the Jesuits, said then to myself, It is really well, and I am very glad that I have not any children. For if I were a father and felt such excessive grief as the old man does, and did not find in my memory or heart all he is now saying, I should throw myself into the sea at once, for I could not bear it. Poor father, murmured the priest. From day to day he lived on alone and more and more solitary. Monsieur Morel and Mercedes came to see him, but his door was closed, and although I was certain he was at home, he would not make any answer. One day, when, contrary to his custom, he had admitted Mercedes, and the poor girl, in spite of her own grief and despair, endeavoured to console him, he said to her, Be assured, my dear doctor, he is dead, and instead of expecting him, it is he who is awaiting us. I am quite happy, for I am the oldest, and of course shall see him first. However well disposed a person may be, why you see we leave off after a time seeing persons who are in sorrow, they make one melancholy, and so at last old Dante was left all to himself and I only saw from time to time strangers go up to him and come down again with some bundle they tried to hide. But I guessed what these bundles were, and what he sold by degrees, what he had to pay for his subsistence. At length the poor old fellow reached the end of all he had. He owed three quarters rent, and they threatened to turn him out. He begged for another week, which was granted to him, I know this because the landlord came into my apartment when he left his. For the first three days I heard him walking about as usual, but on the fourth I heard nothing. I then resolved to go up to him at all risks. The door was closed, but I looked through the keyhole and saw him so pale and haggard that believing him very ill, I went and told Monsieur Morel and then ran on to Mercedes. They both came immediately. Monsieur Morel bringing a doctor, and the doctor said it was inflammation of the bowels and ordered him a limited diet. I was there too, and I never shall forget the old man's smile at his prescription. From that time he received all who came. He had an excuse for not eating any more. The doctor had put him on a diet. The abbe uttered a kind of groan. The story interests you, does it not, sir? inquired Caderousse. Yes, sir, replied the abbe. It is very affecting. Mercedes came again, and she found him so altered that she was even more anxious than before to have him taken to her own home. This was Monsieur Morel's wish also, who would fain have conveyed the old man against his consent. But the old man resisted and cried so that they were actually frightened. Mercedes remained, therefore, by his bedside, and Monsieur Marel went away, making a sign to the Catalan that he had left his purse on the chimney-piece. But availing himself of the doctor's order, the old man would not take any sustenance at length. After nine days of despair and fasting, the old man died, cursing those who had caused his misery, and saying to Mercedes, If you ever see my Edmond again, tell him, I die blessing him. The abbe rose from his chair, and made two turns round the chamber, and pressed his trembling hand against his parched throat. And you believe he died? Of hunger, sir, of hunger, 
said Caderousse. I am as certain of it as that we two are Christians. The abbe, with a shaking hand, seized a glass of water that was standing by him, half full, swallowed it at one gulp, and then resumed his seat, with red eyes and pale cheeks. This was indeed a horrid event, he said in a hoarse voice. The more so, sir, as it was men's and not God's doing. Tell me of these men, said the abbe. And remember, too, he added in an almost menacing tone, you have promised to tell me everything. Tell me, therefore, who are these men who killed the son with despair and the father with famine? The two men, jealous of him, sir, one from love and the other from ambition, Fernand and Danglars. How was this jealousy manifested? Speak on. They denounced Edmond as a Bonapartist agent. Which of the two denounced him? Which was the real delinquent? Both, sir. One with a letter, and the other put it in the post. And where was this letter written? At La Reserve, the day before the betrothal feast. "'Twas so, then, twas so, then,' murmured the abbe. "'Oh, Faria, Faria, how well did you judge men and things!' Oh, "'What did you please to say, sir?' asked Caderousse. "'Nothing, nothing,' replied the priest. "'Go on.' "'It was Donglar who wrote the denunciation with his left hand, "'that his writing might not be recognized.' and Fernand, who put it in the post. But, uh, exclaimed the abbe suddenly, you were there yourself. I, said Caderousse, astonished. Who told you I was there? The abbe saw he had overshot the mark, and he added quickly, No one, but in order to have known everything so well, you must have been an eyewitness. True, true said Caderousse in a choking voice. I, I was there. And did you not remonstrate against such infamy? asked the abbe. If not, you were an accomplice. Sir, replied Caderousse, they had made me drink to such an excess that I nearly lost all perception. I had only an indistinct understanding of what was passing around me. I said all that a man in such a state could say but they both assured me that it was a jest they were carrying on, and perfectly harmless. Next day, next day, sir, you must have seen plain enough what they had been doing, yet you said nothing, though you were present when Dante was arrested. Yes, sir, I was there, and very anxious to speak, but Donglar restrained me. If he should be really guilty said he, and did really put it in the island of Elba. If he is really charged with a letter for the Bonapartist committee at Paris, and if they find this letter upon him, those who have supported him will pass for his accomplice. I confess I had my fears in the state in which politics then were, and I held my tongue. It was cowardly, I confess, but it was not criminal. I understand you allowed matters to take their course. That was all. Yes, sir, answered Caderousse, and remorse preys on me night and day. I often ask pardon of God, I swear to you, because this action, the only one with which I have seriously to reproach myself in all my life, is no doubt the cause of my abject condition. I am expiating a moment of selfishness, and so I always say to La Caconte, when she complains, Hold your tongue, woman, it is the will of God. And Caderousse bowed his head with every sign of real repentance. Well, sir, said the abbe, you have spoken unreservedly, and thus to accuse yourself is to deserve a pardon. Unfortunately, Edmond is dead and does not pardon me. He did not know, said the abbe. 
But he knows it all now, interrupted Caderousse. They say the dead know everything. There was a brief silence. The abbe rose and paced up and down pensively and then resumed his seat. You have two or three times mentioned a Monsieur Morel, he said. Who was he? The owner of the Pharaon and patron of Dante. And what part did he play in this sad drama? inquired the abbe. The part of an honest man, full of courage and real regard. Twenty times he interceded for Edmond. When the emperor returned, he wrote, implored, threatened, and so energetically that on the second restoration he was persecuted as a Bonapartist. Ten times, as I told you, he came to see Dante's father and offered to receive him in his own house. And the night or two before his death, as I have already said, he left his purse on the mantelpiece with which they paid the old man's debts and buried him decently. And so Edmond's father died, as he had lived, without doing harm to anyone. I have the purse still by me, a large one made of red silk. And, asked the abbe, is Monsieur Morel still alive? Yes, replied Caderousse. In that case, replied the abbe, he should be rich or happy. Caderousse smiled bitterly. Yes, happy as myself, said he. What, Monsieur Morel unhappy? exclaimed the abbe. He is reduced almost to the last extremity. Nay, he is almost at the point of dishonour. How? Yes, continued Ferrus. So it is after five and twenty years of labour, after having acquired a most honourable name in the trade of Marseille, Monsieur Morel is utterly ruined. He has lost five ships in two years, has suffered by the bankruptcy of three large houses, and his only hope now is in that very pharaoh which poor Dante commanded, and which is expected from the Indies with a cargo of cochineal and indigo. If this ship founders like the others, he is a ruined man. And has the unfortunate man wife or children? inquired the abbe. Yes, he has a wife, who through everything has behaved like an angel. He has a daughter, who was about to marry the man she loved, but whose family now will not allow him to wed the daughter of a ruined man. He has, besides, a son, a lieutenant in the army, and, as you may suppose, all this, instead of lessening, only augments his sorrows. If he were alone in the world, he would blow out his brains and there would be an end. Horribile! ejaculated the priest. And it is thus Heaven recompenses virtue, sir, added Caderousse. You see, I who never did a bad action, but that I have told you of, I mean destitution, with my poor wife dying of fever before my very eyes, and I unable to do anything in the world for her. I should die of hunger, as old Dante did, while Fernand and Donglar are rolling in wealth. How is that, because their deeds have brought them good fortune, while honest men have been reduced to misery. What has become of Domblard, the instigator and therefore the most guilty? What has become of him? Why, he left Marseille and was taken on the recommendation of Monsieur Morel, who did not know his crime, as cashier into a Spanish bank. During the war with Spain, he was employed in the commissariat of the French army and made a fortune. Then with that money he speculated in the funds and trebled or quadrupled his capital. And having first married his banker's daughter, who left him a widower, he has married a second time, a widow, a Madame de Nargonne, daughter of Monsieur de Servieux, the king's chamberlain, who is in high favour at court. He is a millionaire, and they have made him a baron, and now he is the Baron d'Anglars, with a fine residence on the Rue de Mont Blanc, with ten horses in his stables, six footmen in his antechamber, and I know not how many millions in his strong box. Ah, said the abbe in a peculiar tone, he is happy. Happy? 
Who can answer for that? Happiness or unhappiness is the secret known but to oneself and the walls. Walls have ears but no tongue. But if a large fortune produces happiness, Dongla is happy. And Fernand? A Fernand? Why, much the same story. But how could a poor Catalan fisherboy without education or resources make a fortune? I confess this staggers me. And it has staggered everybody. There must have been in his life some strange secret that no one knows. But then, by what visible steps has he attained his high fortune or high position? Both, sir. He has both fortune and position, both. This must be impossible. It would seem so, but listen, and you will understand. Some days before the return of the emperor, Fernald was drafted. The Bourbons left him quietly enough at the Catalans, but Napoleon returned. A special levy was made, and Fernand was compelled to join. I went too, but as I was older than Fernand, and had just married my poor wife, I was only sent to the coast. Fernand was enrolled in the active troop, went to the frontier with his regiment, and was at the Battle of Ligny. The night after that battle he was sentry at the door of a general who carried on a secret correspondence with the enemy. That same night... The general was to go over to the English. He proposed to Fernand to accompany him. Fernand agreed to do so, deserted his post and followed the general. Fernand would have been court-martialed if Napoleon had remained on the throne, but his action was rewarded by the Bourbons. He returned to France with the epaulette of sub-lieutenant, and as the protection of the general, who is in the highest favour, was accorded to him. He was a captain in 1823, during the Spanish War. That is to say, at the time when Donglar made his early speculations. Fernand was a Spaniard, and being sent to Spain to ascertain the feeling of his fellow countrymen, found Donglar there, got on very intimate terms with him, won over the support of the royalists at the capital, and in the provinces received promises and made pledges on his own part guided his regiment by paths known to himself alone through the mountain gorges which were held by the royalists and in fact rendered such service in this brief campaign that after taking of trocadero he was made colonel and received the title of count and the cross of an officer of the legion of honor destiny destiny murmured the abbe yes but listen this was not all. The war with Spain being ended, Fernand's career was checked by the long peace which seemed likely to endure throughout Europe. Greece only had risen against Turkey, and had begun her war of independence. All eyes were turned towards Athens. It was the fashion to pity and support the Greeks. The French government, without protecting them openly, as you know, gave countenance to volunteer assistance. Fernand sought and obtained leave to go and serve in Greece, still having his name kept on the army roll. Sometime after, it was stated that the Comte de Morcerf, this was the name he bore, had entered the service of Ali Pasha with the rank of Instructor General. Ali Pasha was killed, as you know. But before he died, he recompensed the service of Fernand by leaving him a considerable sum with which he returned to France when he was gazetted Lieutenant General. So that now, inquired the abbe, so that now, continued Caderousse, he owns a magnificent house, numero 27, Rue du Helder, Paris. The abbe opened his mouth, hesitated for a moment, then, making an effort at self-control, he said, And Mercedes... They tell me that she has disappeared. Disappeared, said Caderousse. Yes, as the sun disappears, to rise the next day with still more splendor. Has she made a fortune also? inquired the abbe with an ironical smile. Mercedes is at this moment one of the greatest ladies in Paris, 
replied Caderousse. Go on, said the abbe. It seems as if I were listening to the story of a dream, but I have seen things so extraordinary that what you tell me seems less astonishing than it otherwise might. Mercedes was at first in the deepest despair at the blow which deprived her of Edmond. I have told you of her attempts to propitiate Monsieur de Villefort, her devotion to the elder Dante. In the midst of her despair, a new affliction overtook her. This was the departure of Fernand, of Fernand whose crime she did not know and whom she regarded as her brother. Fernand went, and Mercedes remained alone. Three months passed, and still she wept. No news of Edmond, no news of Fernand, no companionship save that of an old man who was dying with despair. One evening, after a day of accustomed vigil at the angle of two roads leading to Marseille from the Catalans, she returned to her home more depressed than ever. Suddenly, she heard a step she knew, turned anxiously around. The door opened and Fernand, dressed in the uniform of a sub-lieutenant, stood before her. It was not the one she wished for most, but it seemed as if a part of her past had returned to her. Mercedes seized Fernand's hands with a transport which he lo took for love, but which was only joy at being no longer alone in the world, and seeing at last a friend, after long hours of solitary sorrow. And then, it must be confessed, Fernand had never been hated. He was only not precisely loved. Another possessed all Mercedes' heart, that other was absent, had disappeared, perhaps was dead. At this last thought, Mercedes burst into a flood of tears and wrung her hands in agony. But the thought, which she had always repelled before when it was suggested to her by another, came now in full force upon her mind. And then, too, old Dante incessantly said to her, Our Edmond is dead. If he were not... He would return to us. The old man died, as I have told you. Had he lived, Mercedes perchance had not become the wife of another, for he would have been there to reproach her infidelity. Fernand saw this, and when he learned of the old man's death, he returned. He was now a lieutenant. At his first coming, he had not said a word of love to Mercedes. At the second, he reminded her that he loved her. Mercedes begged for six months more in which to await and mourn for Edmond. So that, uh, said the abbe with a bitter smile, that makes eighteen months in all. What more could the most devoted lover desire? Then he murmured the words of the English poet. Frailty, thy name is woman. Six months afterwards, continued Calarus. The marriage took place in the church of Acoul. The very church in which she was to have married Edmond, murmured the priest. There was only a change of bridegrooms. Well, Mercedes was married, proceeded Calarus. But although in the eyes of the world she appeared calm, she nearly fainted as she passed to La Reserve, where eighteen months before the betrothal had been celebrated with him whom she might have known she still loved had she looked to the bottom of her heart. Fernand, more happy but not more at his ease, for I saw at this time he was in constant dread of Edmond's return. Fernand was very anxious to get his wife away and to depart himself. There were too many unpleasant possibilities associated with the Catalans and eight days after the wedding, they left Marseille. Did you ever see Mercedes again? inquired the priest. Yes. During the Spanish war at Perpignan, where Fernand had left her, she was attending to the education of her son. The abbe started. Her son? said he. Yes, replied Cadorus. Little Albert. But then to be able to instruct her child 
continued the abbe. She must have received an education herself. I understood from Edmond that she was the daughter of a simple fisherman, beautiful but uneducated. Oh, replied Cadorus, did he know so little of this lovely betrothed? Mercedes might have been a queen, sir, if the crown were to be placed on the heads of the loveliest and the most intelligent. Fernand's fortune was already waxing great, and she developed with his growing fortune. She learned drawing, music, everything. Besides, I believe between ourselves she did this in order to distract her mind that she might forget, and she only filled her head in order to alleviate the weight on her heart. But now her position in life is assured, continued Cadarus. No doubt fortune and honours have comforted her. She is rich, a countess, and yet... Cadarus paused. And yet what? asked the abbe. Yet I am sure she is not happy, said Cadarus. What makes you believe this? Why, when I found myself utterly destitute, I thought my old friends would perhaps assist me. So I went to Donglar, who would not even receive me. I called on Fernand, who sent me a hundred francs by his valet de chambre. Then you did not see either of them? No, but Madame de Morcerf saw me. How was that? As I went away, a purse fell at my feet. It contained five and twenty louis. I raised my head quickly and saw Mercedes, who at once shut the blind. And Monsieur de Villefort, asked the abbe. Oh, he never was a friend of mine. I did not know him, and I had nothing to ask of him. Do you not know what became of him? and the share he had in Edmond's misfortunes. No, I only know that some time after Edmond's arrest, he married Mademoiselle de saint Meron, and soon after left Marseille, no doubt he has been as lucky as the rest. No doubt he is as rich as Donglard, as high in station as Fernand. I only, as you see, have remained poor, wretched and forgotten. You are mistaken, my friend, replied the abbe. God may seem sometimes to forget for a time while his justice reposes, but there always comes a moment when he remembers and behold a proof. As he spoke, the abbe took the diamond from his pocket and giving it to Cadarus said, Here, my friend, take this diamond. It is yours. What? For me only? cried Cadarus. Ah, sir, do not jest with me. This diamond was to have been shared among his friends. Edmond had one friend only, and thus it cannot be divided. Take the diamond, then, and sell it. It is worth fifty thousand francs, and I repeat my wish that this sum may suffice to release you from your wretchedness. Oh, sir! said Cadarus, putting out one hand timidly, and with the other wiping away the perspiration which bedewed his brow. Oh, sir, do not make a jest of the happiness or despair of a man. I know what happiness and what despair are, and I never make a jest of such feelings. Take it, then. But in exchange... Cadarus, who touched the diamond, withdrew his hand. The abbé smiled. In exchange, he continued, give me the red silk purse that Monsieur Morel left on old Dante's chimney-piece, and which you tell me is still in your hands. Cadarus, more and more astonished, went toward a large oaken cupboard, opened it, and gave the abbé a long purse of faded red silk, round which were two copper runners that had once been gilt. The abbé took it, and in return gave Cadarus the diamond. "'Oh, you are a man of God, sir,' cried Cadarus. "'For no one knew that Edmond had given you his diamond, and you might have kept it.' "'Which,' said the abbé to himself, "'you would have done.' 
The abbe rose, took his hat and gloves. Well, he said, all you have told me is perfectly true, then, and I may believe it in every particular. See, si, sir, replied Caderousse, in this corner is a crucifix in holy wood. Here on this shelf is my wife's testament. Open this book, and I will swear upon it with my hand on the crucifix. I will swear to you by my soul's salvation, my faith as a Christian. I have told everything to you as it occurred, and as the recording angel will tell it to the ear of God at the day of the last judgment. "'Tis well,' said the abbe, convinced by his manner and tone that Caderousse spoke the truth. "'Tis well, and may this money profit you. Adieu. I go far from men who thus so bitterly injure each other. The abbe with difficulty got away from the enthusiastic thanks of Caderousse, opened the door himself, got out, and mounted his horse, once more saluted the innkeeper, who kept uttering his loud farewells, and then returned by the road he had travelled in coming. When Caderousse turned around, he saw behind him La Carconte, paler and trembling more than ever. "'Is then all that I have heard really true?' she inquired. "'What? That he has given the diamond to us only?' inquired Caderousse, half bewildered with joy. "'Yes, and nothing more true. See, here it is.' The woman gazed at it a moment and then said in a gloomy voice, "'Suppose it's false.' Caderousse started and turned pale. "'False,' he muttered. "'False? Why should that man give me a false diamond?' "'To get your secret without paying for it, you blockhead!' Caderousse remained for a moment aghast under the weight of such an idea. Oh, he said, taking up his hat, which he placed on the red handkerchief, tied around his head. We will soon find out. In what way? Why, the fair is on at Beaucaire. There are always jewellers from Paris there, and I will show it to them. Look after the housewife, and I shall be back in two hours. And Caderousse left the house in haste and ran rapidly in the direction opposite to that which the priest had taken. Fifty thousand francs, muttered La Carconte, when left alone. It is a large sum of money, but it is not a fortune. End of chapter 27Chapter 28 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 28 The Prison Register. The day after that, in which the scene we have just described had taken place, on the road between Bellegarde and Beaucaire, a man of about thirty or two and thirty, dressed in a bright blue frock coat, nankeen trousers and a white waistcoat, having the appearance and accent of an Englishman, presented himself before the mayor of Marseille. Sir, said he, I am chief clerk of the house of Thompson and French of Rhone. We are, and have been these ten years, connected with the house of Morel and son of Marseille. We have a hundred thousand francs, or thereabouts, loaned on their securities, and we are a little uneasy at reports that have reached us, that the firm is on the brink of ruin. I have come, therefore, express from Rome, to ask you for information. Sir, replied the mayor, I know very well that during the last four or five years a misfortune has seemed to pursue Monsieur Morel. He has lost four or five vessels and suffered by three or four bankruptcies, but it is not for me, although I am a creditor myself, to the amount of ten thousand francs, to give any information as to the state of his finances. Ask of me as mayor what is my opinion of Monsieur Morel, and I shall say that he is a man honourable to the last degree, and who has up to this time fulfilled every engagement with scrupulous punctuality. This is all I can say, sir. If you wish to learn more, address yourself to Monsieur de Beauville, the inspector of prisons. Number 15, Rue de Noailles. He has, I believe, 200,000 francs, 
in Morel's hands. And if there be any grounds for apprehension, as this is a greater amount than mine, you will most probably find him better informed than myself. The Englishman seemed to appreciate this extreme delicacy, made his bow and went away, proceeding with a characteristic British stride towards the street mentioned. Monsieur de Beauville was in his private room, and the Englishman, on perceiving him, made a gesture of surprise which seemed to indicate that it was not the first time he had been in his presence. As to Monsieur de Beauville, he was in such a state of despair that it was evident all the faculties of his mind, absorbed in the thought which occupied him at the moment, did not allow either his memory or his imagination to stray to the past. The Englishman, with the coolness of his nation, addressed him in terms nearly similar to those with which he had accosted the mayor of Marseilles. "'Oh, sir,' exclaimed Monsieur de Beauville, "'your fears are unfortunately but too well founded, and you'll see before you a man in despair. I had two hundred thousand francs placed in the hands of Morel and Son. These two hundred thousand francs were the dowry of my daughter who was to be married in a fortnight.' and these two hundred thousand francs were payable, half on the fifteenth of this month, and the other half on the fifteenth of next month. I had informed Monsieur Morel of my desire to have these payments punctually, and he has been here within the last half hour to tell me that if his ship, the Pharaon, did not come into port on the fifteenth, he would be wholly unable to make this payment. But, said the Englishman, this looks very much like a suspension of payment. It looks more like bankruptcy, exclaimed Monsieur de Beauville despairingly. The Englishman appeared to reflect a moment and then said, From which it would appear, sir, that this credit inspires you with considerable apprehension. To tell you the truth, I consider it lost. Well, then, I will buy it of you. You? Sure? Yes, I. But at a tremendous discount, of course. No, for two hundred thousand francs. Our house, added the Englishman with a laugh, does not do things in that way. And you will pay? Ready money. And the Englishman drew from his pocket a bundle of banknotes which might have been twice the sum Monsieur de Beauville feared to lose. A ray of joy passed across Monsieur de Beauville's countenance, yet he made an effort at self-control and said, "'Sir, I ought to tell you that in all probability you will not realise six per cent of this sum.' "'That's no affair of mine,' replied the Englishman. "'That is the affair of the house of Thompson and French, in whose name I act. They have, perhaps, some motive to serve in hastening the ruin of a rival firm.' But all I know, sir, is that I am ready to hand you over this sum in exchange for your assignment of the debt. I only ask a brokerage. Of course, that is perfectly just, cried Monsieur de Beauville. The commission is usually one and a half. Will you have two, three, five per cent, or even more? Whatever you say. Sir, replied the Englishman, laughing, I am like my house, and do not do such things. No, the commission, I ask, is quite different. Name it, sir, I beg. You are the inspector of prisons. I have been so these fourteen years. You keep the registers of entries and departures. I do. To these registers there are added notes relative to the prisoners. There are special reports on every prisoner. Well, sir, I was educated at home by a poor devil of an abbe, who disappeared suddenly. I have since learned that he was confined in the Chateau d'If, and I should like to learn some particulars of his death. What was his name? The Abbe Faria. Oh, I recollect him perfectly, cried Monsieur de Beauville. He was crazy. Uh, so they said. Oh, he was decidedly. Very possibly. But what sort of madness was it? He pretended to know of an immense treasure, and offered vast sums to the government if they would liberate him. Poor devil, 
And he is dead? Yes, sir. Five or six months ago, last February. You have a good memory, sir, to recollect dates so well. I recollect this because the poor devil's death was accompanied by a singular incident. Uh, may I ask what that was? said the Englishman with an expression of curiosity, which a close observer would have been astonished at discovering in his phlegmatic countenance. Oh, dear sir, yes, the abbe's dungeon was forty or fifty feet distant from that of one of Bonaparte's emissaries, one of those who had contributed the most to the return of the usurper in 1815, a very resolute and very dangerous man. Indeed, said the Englishman. Yes, replied Monsieur de Beauville, I myself had occasion to see this man in 1816 or 1817, and we could only go into his dungeon with a file of soldiers. That man made a deep impression on me. I shall never forget his countenance. The Englishman smiled imperceptibly. And you say, sir, he interposed, that the two dungeons were separated by a distance of fifty feet. But it appears that this Edmond Dante, this dangerous man's name was Edmond Dante. It appears, sir, that this Edmond Dante had procured tools or made them, for they found a tunnel through which the prisoners held communication with one another. This tunnel was dug, no doubt, with an intention of escape. No doubt, but unfortunately for the prisoners, the Abbe Faria had an attack of catalepsy and died. That must have cut short the projects of escape. For the dead man, yes, replied Monsieur de Beauville. But not for the survivor. On the contrary, this Dante saw a means of accelerating his escape. He no doubt thought that the prisoners had died in the Chateau d'If were interred in an ordinary burial ground, and he conveyed the dead man into his own cell, took his place in the sack in which they had sewed up the corpse, and awaited the moment of interment. It was a bold step, and one that showed some courage, remarked the Englishman. As I have already told you, sir, he was a very dangerous man, and, fortunately, by his own act, disembarrassed the government of the fears it had on his account. How was that? How? Do you not comprehend? No. The Chateau d'If has no cemetery, and they simply threw the dead into the sea after fastening a thirty-six pound cannonball to their feet. Well, observed the Englishman as if he was slow of comprehension. Well, they fastened a thirty-six pound ball to his feet and threw him into the sea. Really? exclaimed the Englishman. Yes, sir, continued the inspector of prisons. You may imagine the amazement of the fugitive when he found himself long and long over the rocks. I should like to have seen his face at that moment. That would have been difficult. No matter, replied de Beauville, in supreme good humour, at the certainty of recovering his two hundred thousand francs. No matter. I can fancy it. And he shouted with laughter. So can I, said the Englishman. And he laughed too, but he laughed as the English do, at the end of his teeth. And so, continued the Englishman, who first gained his composure, he was drowned. Unquestionably. So that the governor got rid of the dangerous and the crazy prisoner at the same time. Precisely. But some official document was drawn up to this affair, I suppose, inquired the Englishman. Yes, yes, the mortuary deposition. You understand that Dante relations, if he had any, might have some interest in knowing if he were dead or alive. So that now, if there was anything to inherit from him, they may do so with easy conscience. He is dead, and no mistake about it. Oh, yes, and they may have the fact attested whenever they please. So be it, said the Englishman. But to return to these registers... True, this story has diverted our attention from them. Excuse me. Excuse you for what? For the story. By no means. It really seems to me very curious. Yes, indeed, so, sir. 
you wish to see all relating to the poor abbe, who really was gentleness itself? Yes, uh, you will much oblige me. Go into my study here, and I will show it to you. And they both entered Monsieur de Beauville's study. Everything was here arranged in perfect order. Each register had its number, each file of papers its place. The inspector begged the Englishman to seat himself in an armchair and placed before him the register and documents relative to the Chateau d'If, giving him all the time he desired for the examination. While de Beauville seated himself in a corner and began to read his newspaper, the Englishman easily found the entries relative to the Abbe Faria, but it seemed that the history which the inspector had related interested him greatly, for after having perused the first documents, he turned over the leaves until he reached the deposition respecting Edmond Dante. There he found everything arranged in due order. The accusation, examination, Morel's petition, Monsieur de Villefort's marginal notes. He folded up the accusation quietly and put it as quietly in his pocket read the examination and saw that the name of Noirtier was not mentioned in it, perused to the application dated 10th April 1815, in which Morel, by the deputy procureur's advice, exaggerated with the best intentions, for Napoleon was then on the throne, the services Dante had rendered to the imperial cause, services which Villefort's certificates rendered indispensable. Then he saw through the whole thing. This petition to Napoleon kept back by Villefort, had become, under the second restoration, a terrible weapon against him in the hands of the king's attorney. He was no longer astonished when he searched on to find in the register this note, placed in a bracket against his name. Edmond Dante, an inveterate Bonapartist, took an active part in the return from the island of Elba, to be kept in strict solitary confinement and to be closely watched and guarded. Beneath these lines was written in another hand, See note above, nothing can be done. He compared the writing in the bracket with the writing of the certificate placed beneath Morel's petition, and discovered that the note in the bracket was the same writing as the certificate. That is to say, was in Villefort's handwriting. As to the note which accompanied this, the Englishman understood that it might have been added by some inspector who had taken a momentary interest in Dante's situation but who had, from the remarks we have quoted, found it impossible to give any effect to the interest he had felt. As we have said, the inspector, from discretion, and that he might not disturb the Abbe Faria's pupil in his researches, had seated himself in a corner and was reading Le Drapeau Blanc. He did not see the Englishman fold up and place in his pocket the accusation written by Donglar under the arbor of La Réserve, and which had the postmark Marseille, 27th February, delivery 6 o'clock p.m. But it must be said that if he had seen it, he attached so little importance to this scrap of paper, and so much importance to his 200,000 francs, that he would not have opposed whatever the Englishman might do, however irregular it might be. Thanks, said the latter, closing the register with a slam. I have all I want. Now it is for me to perform my promise. Give me a simple assignment of your debt. Acknowledge therein the receipt of the cash, and I will hand you over the money. He rose, gave his seat to Monsieur de Beauville, who took it without ceremony, and quickly drew up the required assignment, while the Englishman counted out the banknotes on the other side of the desk. End of chapter 28《ラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラプトゥクラ and of happiness that permeates a flourishing and prosperous business establishment, instead of merry faces at the windows, 
busy clerks hurrying to and fro in the long corridors. Instead of the court filled with bales of goods, re-echoing with the cries and the jokes of porters, one would have immediately perceived all aspect of sadness and gloom. Out of all the numerous clerks that used to fill the deserted corridor and the empty office, but two remained. One was a young man of three or four and twenty who was in love with Monsieur Morel's daughter, and had remained with him in spite of the efforts of his friends to induce him to withdraw. The other was an old one-eyed cashier called Gogle, or Cockeye, a nickname given him by the young men who used to throng this vast, now almost deserted beehive, and which had so completely replaced his real name that he would not in all probability have replied to anyone who addressed him by it. Cockler remained in Monsieur Morel's service, and a most singular change had taken place in his position. He had at the same time risen to the rank of cashier, and sunk to the rank of a servant. He was, however, the same Cockler, good, patient, devoted, but inflexible on the subject of arithmetic, the only point in which he would have stood firm against the world, even against Monsieur Morel, and strong in the multiplication table which he had at his finger's ends no matter what scheme or what trap was laid to catch him. In the midst of the disaster that befell the house, Gokler was the only one unmoved. But this did not arise from a want of affection, on the contrary, from a firm conviction. Like the rats that one by one forsake the doomed ship even before the vessel weighs anchor, so all the numerous clerks had by degrees deserted the office and the warehouse. Gokler had seen them go without thinking of inquiring the cause of their departure. Everything was, as we have said, a question of arithmetic to Gorkler, and during twenty years he had always seen all payments made with such exactitude that it seemed as impossible to him that the house should stop payment as it would to a miller that the river that had so long turned his mill should cease to flow. Nothing had as yet occurred to shake Gorkler's belief the last month's payment had been made with the most scrupulous exactitude. Cockler had detected an overbalance of fourteen sous in his cash, and the same evening he had brought them to Monsieur Morel, who, with a melancholy smile, threw them into an almost empty drawer, saying, "'Thanks, Cockler. You are the pearl of cashier.' Cockler went away perfectly happy for this eulogium of Monsieur Morel himself, the pearl of the honest men of Marseille, flattered him more than a present of fifty crowns. But since the end of the month, Monsieur Morel had passed many an anxious hour. In order to meet the payments then due, he had collected all his resources, and, fearing lest the report of his distress should get bruited abroad at Marseille, when he was known to be reduced to such an extremity, he went to the Bouquet Fair to sell his wife's and daughter's jewels and a portion of his plate. By this means the end of the month was past, but his resources were now exhausted. Credit, owing to the reports afloat, was no longer to be had, and to meet the one hundred thousand francs due on the tenth of the present month, and the one hundred thousand francs due on the fifteenth of the next month to Monsieur de Beauville, Monsieur Morel had, in reality, no hope but the return of the pharaoh, of whose departure he had learned from a vessel which had weighed anchor at the same time and which had already arrived in harbour. But this vessel, which, like the pharaoh, came from Calcutta, had been in for a fortnight, while no intelligence had been received of the pharaoh. Such was the state of affairs, when the day after his interview with Monsieur de Beauville, the confidential clerk of the house of Thompson and French of Rome presented himself at Monsieur Morel's. Emmanuel received him, this young man was alarmed by the appearance of every new face, for every new face might be that of a new creditor, come in anxiety to question the head of the house. The young man, wishing to spare his employer the pain of this interview, questioned the newcomer. But the stranger declared that he had nothing to say to Monsieur Emmanuel, and that his business was with Monsieur Morel in person. Emmanuel sighed and summoned Cockler. Cochla appeared, and the young man bade him conduct the stranger to Monsieur Morel's apartment. Cochla went first, and the stranger followed him. On the staircase they met a beautiful girl of sixteen or seventeen, who looked with anxiety at the stranger. 
Monsieur Morel is in his room, is he not, Mademoiselle Julie? said the cashier. Yes, I think so, at least, said the young girl hesitatingly. Go and see, Cochle, and if my father is there, announce this gentleman. It will be useless to announce me, Mademoiselle, returned the Englishman. Monsieur Morel does not know my name. This worthy gentleman is only to announce the confidential clerk of the house of Thompson and French of Rome, with whom your father does business. The young girl turned pale, and continued to descend while the stranger and Cochle continued to mount the staircase. She entered the office where Emmanuel was, while Cochle, by the aid of a key he possessed, opened a door in the corner of a landing place on the second staircase, conducted the stranger into an antechamber, opened a second door, which he closed behind him, and after having left the clerk of the house of Thompson and French alone, returned and signed to him that he could enter. The Englishman entered and found Morel seated at a table, turning over the formidable columns of his ledger, which contained the list of his liabilities. At the sight of the stranger, Monsieur Morel closed the ledger, arose and offered a seat to the stranger, and when he had seen him seated, resumed his own chair. Fourteen years had changed the worthy merchant, who in his thirty-sixth year, at the opening of this history, was now in his fiftieth. His hair turned white, time and sorrow had ploughed deep furrows in his brow, and his look, once so firm and penetrating, was now irresolute and wandering, as if he feared being forced to fix his attention on some particular thought or person. The Englishman looked at him with an air of curiosity, evidently mingled with interest. "'Monsieur,' said Morel, whose uneasiness was increased by this examination, "'you wish to speak to me?' "'Yes, monsieur. You are aware from whom I come. The house of Thompson and French, at least, so my cashier tells me. He has told you rightly. The house of Thompson French had three hundred thousand or four hundred thousand francs to pay this month in France, and knowing your strict punctuality, have collected all the bills bearing your signature, and charged me as they became due to present them, and to employ the money otherwise. Morel sighed deeply, and passed his hand over his forehead, which was covered with perspiration. "'So then, sir,' said Morel, "'you owe the bills of mine?' "'Yes, and for a considerable sum.' "'What is the amount?' asked Morel, with a voice he strove to render firm. "'Here is,' said the Englishman, taking a quantity of papers from his pocket, "'an assignment of two hundred thousand francs to our house by a Monsieur de Beauville, the inspector of prisons, to whom they are due. You acknowledge, of course, that you owe this sum to him. Yes. He placed the money in my hands at four and a half percent, nearly five years ago. When are you to pay? Half the fifteenth of this month, half the fifteenth of next. Just so. And now here are thirty-two thousand five hundred francs payable shortly. They are all signed by you, and assigned to our house by the holders. I recognize them, said Morel, whose face was suffused as he thought that for the first time in his life he would be unable to honor his own signature. Is this all? And no, I have for the end of the month these bills which have been assigned to us by the house of Pascal, and the house of Wilde and Turner of Marseille amounting to nearly 55,000 francs in all, 287,500 francs. It is impossible to describe what Morel suffered during this enumeration. The 287,500 francs, repeated he. Yes, sir, replied the Englishman. I will not, continued he after a moment's silence, a conceal from you, that while your probity and exactitude up to this moment are universally acknowledged, yet the report is current in Marseilles that you are not able to meet your liabilities. At this almost brutal speech, Morel turned deathly pale. Sir, said he, up to this time, and it is now more than four and twenty years since I received the direction of this house from my father, who had himself conducted it for five-and-thirty years. 
never has anything bearing the signature of Marilyn's son been dishonored. I know that, replied the Englishman, but as a man of honor should answer another, tell me fairly, shall you pay these with the same punctuality? Morel shuddered and looked at the man who spoke with more assurance than he had hitherto shown. Two questions, frankly put, said he. A straightforward answer should be given. Yes, I shall pay if, as I hope, my vessel arrives safely, for its arrival will again procure me the credit which the numerous accidents of which I have been the victim have deprived me. But if the pharaoh should be lost, and this last resource be gone, the poor man's eyes filled with tears. Well, said the other, if this last resource fail you. Well, returned Morel, it is a cruel thing to be forced to say, but already used to misfortune I must habituate myself to shame. I fear I shall be forced to suspend payment. Have you no friends who could assist you? Morel smiled mournfully. In business, sir, said he, one has no friends, only correspondence. It is true, murmured the Englishman. Then you have but one hope. But one. The last? The last. So that if this fail, I am ruined, completely ruined. As I was on my way here, a vessel was coming into port. I know it, sir. A young man, who still adheres to my fallen fortunes, passes a part of his time in a belvedere at the top of the house, in hopes of being the first to announce good news to me. He has informed me of the arrival of this ship. And it is not yours? No. She is a Bordeaux vessel, La Gironde. She comes from India also, but she is not mine. Perhaps she has spoken to the pharaoh and brings you some tidings of her. Shall I tell you plainly one thing, sir? I dread almost as much to receive any tidings of my vessel as to remain in doubt. Uncertainty is still hope. Then in a low voice Morel added, This delay is not natural. The pharaoh left Calcutta the 5th of February. She ought to have been here a month ago. What is that? said the Englishman. What is the meaning of that noise? Oh, oh! cried Morel, turning pale. What is it? A loud noise was heard on the stairs of people moving hastily and half-stifled sobs. Morel rose and advanced to the door, but his strength failed him, and he sank into a chair. The two men remained opposite one another, Morel trembling in every limb, the stranger gazing at him with an air of profound pity. The noise had ceased, but it seemed that Morel expected something, Something had occasioned the noise, and something must follow. The stranger had fancied he heard footsteps on the stairs, and that the footsteps, which were those of several persons, stopped at the door. A key was inserted in the lock of the first door, and the creaking of hinges was audible. "'There are only two persons who have the key to that door,' murmured Morel. "'Cockle and Julie.' At this instant, the second door opened, and the young girl, her eyes bathed with tears, appeared. Morel rose tremblingly, supporting himself by the arm of the chair. He would have spoken, but his voice failed him. "'Oh, father,' said she, clasping her hands, "'forgive your child for being the bearer of evil tidings.' Morel again changed colour. Julie threw herself into his arms. "'Oh, father! Father!' murmured she. Courage! The fair one has gone down then, said Morel in a hoarse voice. The young girl did not speak, but she made an affirmative sign with her head as she lay on her father's breast. And the crew? asked Morel. Saved, said the girl. Saved by the crew of the vessel that has just entered the harbour. Morel raised his two hands to heaven with an expression of resignation and sublime gratitude. "'Thanks, my God,' said he. 
at least thou strikest but me alone. A tear moistened the eye of the phlegmatic Englishman. Come in, come in, said Morel, for I presume you are all at the door. Scarcely had he uttered these words than Madame Morel entered weeping bitterly. Emmanuel followed her, and in the antechamber were visible the rough faces of seven or eight half-naked sailors. At the sight of these men, the Englishman started and advanced a step, then restrained himself and retired into the farthest and most obscure corner of the apartment. Madame Morel sat down by her husband and took one of his hands in hers. Julie still lay with her head on his shoulder. Emmanuel stood in the centre of the chamber and seemed to form the link between Morel's family and the sailors at the door. "'How did this happen?' said Morel. "'Draw near, Penelon,' said the young man, "'and tell us all about it.' An old seaman, bronzed by the tropical sun, advanced, twirling the remains of a tarpaulin between his hands. "'Good day, Monsieur Morel,' said he, as if he had just quitted Marseille the previous evening, and had just returned from Aix or Toulon. "'Good day, Penelon,' returned Morel, who could not refrain from smiling through his tears. "'Where is the captain?' "'Le captain, Monsieur Morel. He has stayed behind the sick at Palma. But, please God, it won't be much, and you will see him in a few days, all alive and hearty. Well, now, tell your story, Penelon. Penelon rolled his quid in his cheek, placed his hand before his mouth, turned his head and sent a long jet of tobacco juice into the antechamber, advanced his foot, balanced himself, and began. Yeah, you see, Monsieur Morel, said he, Oh, we were somewhere between Cape Blanc and Cape Boyadar, sailing with a fair breeze, south southwest after a week's calm, when Captain Gomar comes up to me. I was at the helm, I should tell you, and says, Penelon, what do you think of those clouds coming up over there? I was just then looking at them myself. What do I think, Captain? Oh, I think they are rising faster than they have any business to do, and that they would not be so black if they didn't mean mischief. That's my opinion, too, said the captain, and I'll take precautions accordingly. We are carrying too much canvas. Now, vast there, all hands. Take in the studding soles and store the flying jib. It was time. The squall was on us and the vessel began to yield. Ah, uh, said the captain, we have still too much canvas set. All hands lower the mains. Five minutes after, it was down, and we sailed under mizzen topsails and top gallant sails. Well, Penelon, said the captain, what makes you shake your head? Why, I says, I still think you've got too much on. I think you're right, answered he. We shall have a gale. A gale? More than that, we shall have a tempest, or I don't know what's what. You could see the wind coming, like the dust at Montredon. Luckily, the captain understood his business. Take in two reefs in the topsails, cried the captain. Let go the bowlings, all the brace. Lower the gallant sails, haul out the reef tackles on the yards. That was not enough for those latitudes, said the Englishman. I should have taken four reefs in the top sails and furled the stanker. His firm, sonorous and unexpected voice made everyone start. Penelon put his hand over his eyes and then stared at the man who thus criticised the manoeuvres of his captain. Oh, he did better than that, sir, said the old sailor respectfully. We put the helm up to run before the tempest. Ten minutes after we struck our topsails and scudded under bare poles. The vessel was very old to risk that, said the Englishman. It was that that did the business after pitching heavily for twelve hours. We sprung a leak. Penelon, 
said the captain. I think we are sinking. Give me the helm and go down into the hold. I gave him the helm and descended. There was already three feet of water. All hands to the pumps, I shouted. But it was too late. And it seemed the more we pumped, the more came in. Ah, uh, said I, after four hours work, since we are sinking, let us sink. We can die but once. That's the example you set, Penelon, cries the captain. Very well, wait a minute. He went into his cabin and came back with a brace of pistols. I will blow the brains out of the first man who leaves the pump, said he. Well done, said the Englishman. There's nothing gives you so much courage as good reasons, continued the sailor. And during that time, the wind had abated and the sea gone down. But the water kept rising. Not much, only two inches an hour. But still it rose. Two inches an hour does not seem much. But in twelve hours, that makes two feet. And three we had before, that makes five. Come, said the captain, we have done all in our power, and Monsieur Morel will have nothing to reproach us with. We have tried to save the ship. Let us now save ourselves. To the boats, my lads, as quick as you can, now, continued Penelon. You see, Monsieur Morel, a sailor is attached to his ship, but still more to his life. So we did not wait to be told twice. The more so that the ship was sinking under us and seemed to say, Get along, save yourselves. We soon launched the boat and all eight of us got into it. The captain descended last, or rather, he did not descend, he would not quit the vessel, so I took him round the waist and threw him into the boat, and then I jumped after him. It was time, for just as I jumped the deck burst with a noise like the broadside of a man of war. Ten minutes after, she pitched forward, then the other way, spun round and round and then goodbye to the pharaoh. As for us, we were three days without anything to eat or drink, so that we began to think of drawing lots, who should feed the rest, when we saw La Gironde. We made signals of distress. She perceived us, made for us and take us all on board. There now, Monsieur Morel, that's the whole truth on the honor of a sailor. Is not it true, you fellows there? A general murmur of approbation showed that the narrator had faithfully detailed their misfortunes and sufferings. Well, well, said Monsieur Morel, I know there was no time in fault but destiny. It was the will of God that this should happen. Blessed be his name. What wages are due to you? Oh, don't let us talk of that, Monsieur Morel. Yes, but we will talk of it. Oh, well then, a three months, said Penelon. Cockle, pay two hundred francs to each of these good fellows, said Morel. At another time, added he, I should have said, give them besides two hundred francs over as a present, but the times are changed, and the little money that remains to me is not my own. Penelon turned to his companions and exchanged a few words with them. As for that, Monsieur Morel, said he, again turning his quid, as for that. As for what? The money. Well? Well, we all say that fifty francs will be enough for us at present, and that we will wait for the rest. Thanks, my friends, thanks, cried Monsieur Morel gratefully. Take it, take it, and if you can find another employer, enter his service. You are free to do so. These last words produced a prodigious effect on the seaman. Penelon nearly swallowed his quid. Fortunately, he recovered. What? Monsieur Morel? said he in a low voice. You send us away? You were then angry with us? No, no, said Monsieur Morel. I am not angry, quite the contrary. And I do not send you away, but I have no more ships, and therefore I do not want any sailors. "'No more ships?' returned Penelon. 
Well then, you'll build some. We'll wait for you. I have no money to build ships with, Penelon, said the poor owner mournfully. So I cannot accept your kind offer. No more money? Then you must not pay us. We can scud like the pharaoh under bare poles. Enough, enough, cried Morel, almost overpowered. Leave me, I pray you. We shall meet again in a happier time. Emmanuel, go with them and see that my orders are executed. At least we shall see each other again, Monsieur Morel, asked Penelon. Yes, I hope so, at least. No, go. He made a sign to Cocle, who went first. The seamen followed him, and Emmanuel brought up the rear. Now, said the owner to his wife and daughter, leave me. I wish to speak with this gentleman. And he glanced towards the clerk of Thompson and French, who had remained motionless in the corner during this scene, in which he had taken no part, except the few words we have mentioned. The two women looked at this person, whose presence they had entirely forgotten, and retired, but as she left the apartment, Julie gave the stranger a supplicating glance, to which he replied by a smile, that an indifferent spectator would have been surprised to see on his stern features. The two men were left alone. "'Well, sir,' said Morel, sinking into a chair, "'you have heard all, and I have nothing further to tell you.' "'I see,' returned the Englishman, "'that a fresh and unmerited misfortune has overwhelmed you, "'and this only increases my desire to serve you.' "'Oh, sir,' cried Morel, "'let me see,' continued the stranger. "'I am one of your largest creditors. "'Your bills at least are the first that will fall due. "'Do you wish for time to pay?' A delay would save my honour, and consequently my life. How long a delay do you wish for? Morel reflected. Two months, said he. I will give you three, replied the stranger. But, asked Morel, will the house of Thompson and French consent? Oh, I take everything on myself. Today is the 5th of June. Yes, well, renew these bills up to the 5th of September, and on the 5th of September at eleven o'clock, the hand of the clock pointed to eleven, I shall come to receive the money. I shall expect you, returned Morel, and I will pay you, or I shall be dead. These last words were uttered in so low a tone that the stranger could not hear them. The bills were renewed, the old ones destroyed, and the poor shipowner found himself with three months before him to collect his resources. The Englishman received his thanks with the phlegm peculiar to his nation, and Morel, overwhelming him with grateful blessings, conducted him to the staircase. The stranger met Julie on the stairs. She pretended to be descending, but in reality she was waiting for him. "'Oh, sir,' she said, clasping her hands. Oh, "'Mademoiselle,' said the stranger, one day you will receive a letter signed Sinbad the Sailor. Do exactly what the letter bids you, however strange it may appear. Yes, sir, returned Julie. Do you promise? I swear to you I will. It is well. Adieu, mademoiselle. Continue to be the good, sweet girl you are at present, and I have great hopes that heaven will reward you by giving you Emmanuel for a husband. Julie uttered a faint cry, blushed like a rose, and leaned against the baluster. The stranger waved his hand and continued to descend. In the court he found Penelon, who, with a rouleau of a hundred francs in either hand, seemed unable to make up his mind to retain them. "'Come with me, my friend,' said the Englishman. "'I wish to speak to you.'" End of chapter 29 Chapter 30 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30 The 5th of September. 
The extension provided for by the agent of Thompson and French, at the moment when Morel expected it least, was to the poor shipowner so decided a stroke of good fortune that he almost dared to believe that fate was at length grown weary of wasting her spite upon him. The same day he told his wife, Emmanuel, and his daughter all that had occurred, and a ray of hope, if not of tranquillity, returned to the family. Unfortunately, however, Morel had not only engagements with the house of Thomason and French, who had shown themselves so considerate toward him, and as he had said, in business he had correspondents and not friends. When he thought the matter over, he could by no means account for this generous conduct on the part of Thompson and French towards him, and could only attribute it to some such selfish argument as this. We had better help a man who owes us nearly 300,000 francs, and have those 300,000 francs at the end of three months that hasten his ruin, and get only six or eight percent of our money back again. Unfortunately, whether through envy or stupidity, all Morel's correspondents did not take this view, and some even came to a contrary decision. The bills signed by Morel were presented at his office with scrupulous exactitude, and thanks to the delay granted by the Englishman, were paid by Cochler with equal punctuality. Cochler thus remained in his accustomed tranquillity. It was Morel alone who remembered with alarm that if he had to repay on the 15th the 50,000 francs of Monsieur de Beauville, and on the 30th the 32,500 francs of bills for which, as well as the debt due to the inspector of prisons, he had time granted, he must be a ruined man. The opinion of all the commercial men was that under the reverses which had successfully weighed down Morel, it was impossible for him to remain solvent. Great, therefore, was the astonishment when at the end of the month he cancelled all his obligations with his usual punctuality. Still, confidence was not restored to all minds, and the general opinion was that the complete ruin of the unfortunate shipowner had been postponed only until the end of the month. The month passed, and Morel made extraordinary efforts to get in all his resources. Formerly his paper, at any date, was taken with confidence, and was even in request. Morel now tried to negotiate bills at ninety days only, and none of the banks would give him credit. Fortunately, Morel had some funds coming in on which he could rely, and as they reached him, he found himself in a condition to meet his engagements when the end of July came. The agent of Thompson and French had not been again seen at Marseille. The day after, or two days after his visit to Morel, he had disappeared and as in that city he had no intercourse but with the mayor, the inspector of prisons, and Monsieur Morel, his departure left no trace, except in the memories of those three persons. As to the sailors of the Ferron, they must have found snug berths elsewhere, for they also had disappeared. Captain Gomard, recovered from his illness, had returned from Palma. He delayed presenting himself at Morel's, but the owner, hearing of his arrival, went to see him. The worthy shipowner knew from Penelon's recital of the captain's brave conduct during the storm, and tried to console him. He brought him also the amount of his wages which Captain Gomard had not dared to apply for. As he descended the staircase, Morel met Penelon, who was going up. Penelon had, it would seem, made good use of his money, for he was newly clad. When he saw his employer, the worthy tar seemed much embarrassed drew on one side into the corner of the landing-place, passed his quid from one cheek to the other, stared stupidly with his great eyes, and only acknowledged the squeeze of the hand which Morel as usual gave him by a slight pressure in return. Morel attributed Penelon's embarrassment to the elegance of his attire. It was evident the good fellow had not gone to such an expense on his own account. He was, no doubt, engaged on board some other vessel, and thus his bashfulness arose from the fact of this not having, if we may so express ourselves, worn mourning for the pharaoh and longer. Perhaps he had come to tell Captain Gomard of his good luck, and to offer him employment from his own new master. "'Worthy fellows,' said Morel as he went away, "'may your new master love you as I loved you, and be more fortunate than I have been.' August rolled by in unceasing efforts on the part of Morel to renew his credit or revive the old. On the 20th of August, 
it was known at Marseilles that he had left town in the mail coach, and it was said that the bills would go to protests at the end of the month, and the Morel had gone away and left his chief clerk, Emmanuel, and his cashier, Cochle, to meet the creditors. But contrary to all expectation, when the 31st of August came, the house opened as usual, and Cochle appeared behind the grating of the counter, examined all bills presented with the usual scrutiny, and from first to last paid all with the usual precision. There came in, moreover, two drafts which M. Morel had fully anticipated, and which Cochle paid as punctually as the bills which the shipowner had accepted. All this was incomprehensible. And then, with a tenacity peculiar to profits of bad news, the failure was put off until the end of September. On the first, Morel returned, and he was awaited by his family with extreme anxiety, for from this journey to Paris they hoped great things. Morel had thought of Donglard, who was now immensely rich and had lain under great obligations to Morel in former days, since to him it was owing that Donglar entered the service of the Spanish banker, with whom he had laid the foundations of his vast wealth. It was said at this moment that Donglar was worth from six to eight millions of francs, and had unlimited credit. Donglar then, without taking a crown from his pocket, could save Morel. He had but to pass his word for a loan, and Morel was saved. Morel had long thought of Donglar, but had kept away from some instinctive motive and had delayed as long as possible, availing himself of this last resource. And Morel was right, for he returned home crushed by the humiliation of a refusal. Yet on his arrival, Morel did not utter a complaint or say one harsh word. He embraced his weeping wife and daughter, pressed Emmanuel's hand with friendly warmth, and then going to his private room on the second floor, had sent for Cochle. Then, said the two women to Emmanuel, we are indeed ruined. It was agreed in a brief council held among them that Julie should write to her brother, who was in garrison at Nîmes, to come to them as speedily as possible. The poor women felt instinctively that they required all their strength to support the blow that impended. Besides, Maximilien Morel, though hardly two and twenty, had great influence over his father. He was a strong-minded, upright young man. At the time when he decided on his profession, his father had no desire to choose for him, but had consulted young Maximilien's taste. He had at once declared for a military life, and had in consequence studied hard, passed brilliantly through the Polytechnic School, and left it as sub-lieutenant of the 53rd on the line. For a year he had held his rank, and expected promotion on the first vacancy. In his regiment, Maximilien Morel was noted for his rigid observance, not only of the obligations imposed on a soldier, but also of the duties of a man, and he thus gained the name of the Stoic. We need hardly say that many of those who gave him this epithet repeated it because they had heard it, and did not even know what it meant. This was the young man whom his mother and sister called to their aid to sustain them under the serious trial which they felt they would soon have to endure. They had not mistaken the gravity of this event, for the moment after Morel had entered his private office with Cochle, Julie saw the latter leave it pale, trembling, and his features betraying the utmost consternation. She would have questioned him as he passed by her, but the worthy creature hastened down the staircase with unusual precipitation, and only raised his hands to heaven and exclaimed, Oh, mademoiselle, mademoiselle, what a dreadful misfortune! Who could ever have believed it? A moment afterwards, Julie saw him go upstairs carrying two of three heavy ledgers, a portfolio, and a bag of money. Morel examined the ledgers opened the portfolio and counted the money. All his funds amounted to 6,000 or 8,000 francs, his bills receivable up to the fifth to 4,000 or 5,000, which, making the best of everything, gave him 14,000 francs to meet debts amounting to 287,500 francs. He had not even the means for making a possible settlement on account. However, when Morel went down to his dinner, he appeared very calm. 
This calmness was more alarming to the two women than the deepest dejection would have been. After dinner, Morel usually went out and used to take his coffee at the Fossean Club and read the semaphore. This day he did not leave the house, but returned to his office. As to Coquelu, he seemed completely bewildered. For part of the day he went into the courtyard, seated himself on a stone with his head bare and exposed to the blazing sun. Emmanuel tried to comfort the women, but his eloquence faltered. The young man was too well acquainted with the business of the house not to feel that a great catastrophe hung over the Morel family. Night came. The two women had watched, hoping that when he left this room, Morel would come to them. But they heard him pass before their door and trying to conceal the noise of his footsteps. They listened. He went into his sleeping room and fastened the door inside. Madame Morel sent her daughter to bed, and half an hour after Julie had retired, she rose, took off her shoes, and went stealthily along the passage to see through the keyhole what her husband was doing. In the passage she saw a retreating shadow. It was Julie, who uneasy herself had anticipated her mother. The young lady went towards Madame Morel. "'He is writing,' she said. They had understood each other without speaking. Madame Morel looked again through the keyhole. Morel was writing. But Madame Morel remarked, what her daughter had not observed, that her husband was writing on stamped paper. The terrible idea that he was writing his will flashed across her. She shuddered, and yet had not strength to utter a word. Next day Monsieur Morel seemed as calm as ever, went into his office as usual, came to his breakfast punctually, and then, after dinner, he placed his daughter beside him took her head in his arms, and held her for a long time against his bosom. In the evening, Julie told her mother that although he was apparently so calm, she had noticed that her father's heart beat violently. The next two days passed in much the same way. On the evening of the 4th of September, Monsieur Morel asked his daughter for the key of his study. Julie trembled at this request, which seemed to her of bad omen. Why did her father ask for this key which she always kept and which was only taken from her in childhood as a punishment? The young girl looked at Morel. What have I done wrong, father, she said, that you should take this key from me? Nothing, my dear, replied the unhappy man, the tears starting to his eyes at this simple question. Nothing, only I want it. Julie made a pretense to feel for the key. I must have left it in my room, she said, and she went out, but instead of going to her apartment, she hastened to consult Emmanuel. Do not give this key to your father, said he, and tomorrow morning, if possible, do not quit him for a moment. She questioned Emmanuel, but he knew nothing and would not say what he knew. During the night between the 4th and 5th of September, Madame Morel remained listening for every sound and until three o'clock in the morning she heard her husband pacing the room in great agitation. It was three o'clock when he threw himself on the bed. The mother and daughter passed the night together. They had expected Maximilian since the previous evening. At eight o'clock in the morning Morel entered their chamber. He was calm, but the agitation of the night was legible on his pale and careworn visage. They did not dare to ask him how he had slept. Morel was kinder to his wife, more affectionate to his daughter than he had ever been. He could not cease gazing at and kissing the sweet girl. Julie, mindful of Emmanuel's request, was following her father when he quitted the room. But he said to her quickly, Remain with your mother, dearest. Julie wished to accompany him. I wish you to do so, said he. This was the first time Morel had ever so spoken. But he said it in a tone of paternal kindness, and Julie did not dare to disobey. She remained at the same spot, standing mute and motionless. An instant afterwards the door opened. She felt two arms encircle her, and a mouth pressed her forehead. She looked up and uttered an exclamation of joy. "'Maximilian! My dearest brother!' she cried. At these words, Madame Morel rose and threw herself into her son's arm. Mother, 
said the young man, looking alternately at Madame Morel and her daughter. "'What has occurred? What has happened? Your letters have frightened me, and I have come hither with all speed.' "'Julie,' said Madame Morel, making a sign to the young man, "'go and tell your father that Maximilian has just arrived.' The young lady rushed out of the apartment, but on the first step of the staircase she found a man holding a letter in his hand. "'Are you not a Mademoiselle Julie Morel?' inquired the man with a strong Italian accent. "'Yes, sir,' replied Julie, with hesitation. "'What is your pleasure? I do not know you.' "'Read this letter,' he said, handing it to her. Julie hesitated. "'It concerns the best interests of your father,' said the messenger. The young girl hastily took the letter from him. She opened it quickly and read, "'Go this moment to the Allée de Meillon. Enter the house number fifteen. Ask the porter for the key of the room on the fifth floor. Enter the apartment. Take from the corner of the mantelpiece a purse netted in red silk and give it to your father. It is important that he should receive it before eleven o'clock. You promise to obey me implicitly. Remember your oath. Sinbad the Sailor The young girl uttered a joyful cry, raised her eyes, looked round to question the messenger, but he had disappeared. She cast her eyes again over the note to peruse it a second time and saw there was a postscript. She read, It is important that you should fulfil this mission in person and alone. If you go accompanied by any other person, or should anyone else go in your place, the porter will reply that he does not know anything about it. This postscript decreased greatly the young girl's happiness. Was there nothing to fear? Was there not some snare laid for her? Her innocence had kept her in ignorance of the dangers that might assail a young girl of her age. But there is no need to know danger in order to fear it. Indeed, it may be observed that it is usually unknown perils that inspire the greatest terror. Julie hesitated and resolved to take counsel. Yet through a singular impulse it was neither to her mother nor her brother that she applied, but to Emmanuel. She hastened down and told him what had occurred on the day when the agent of Thompson and French had come to her father's, related the scene on the staircase, repeated the promise she had made, and showed him the letter. "'You must go then, mademoiselle,' said Emmanuel. "'Go there?' murmured Julie. "'Yes, I will accompany you.' "'But did you not read that I must be alone?' said Julie. "'And you shall be alone,' replied the young man. "'I will await you at the corner of the Rue de Musée, "'and if you are so long absent as to make me uneasy, "'I will hasten to rejoin you, "'and woe to him of whom you shall have cause to complain to me.' Then, Emmanuel, said the young girl with hesitation, it is your opinion that I should obey this invitation? Yes. Did not the messenger say your father's safety depended upon it? But what danger threatens him, then, Emmanuel? she asked. Emmanuel hesitated a moment, but his desire to make Julie decide immediately made him reply, Listen, he said, today is the 5th of September, is it not? Yes. Today, then, at eleven o'clock, your father has nearly three hundred thousand francs to pay. Yes, we know that. Well, then, continued Emmanuel, we have not fifteen thousand francs in the house. What will happen, then? Why, if today before eleven o'clock your father has not found someone who will come to his aid, he will be compelled at twelve o'clock to declare himself bankrupt. Oh! "'Come, then, come!' cried she, hastening away with the young man. During this time, Madame Morel had told her son everything. The young man knew quite well that, after the succession of misfortunes which had befallen his father, great changes had taken place in the style of living and housekeeping. But he did not know that matters had reached such a point. He was thunderstruck. Then, rushing hastily out of the apartment, he ran upstairs, expecting to find his father in his study, but he rapped there in vain. While he was yet at the door of the study, he heard the bedroom door open, turned and saw his father. Instead of going direct to his study, Monsieur Morel had returned to his bedchamber, 
which he was only this moment quitting. Morel uttered a cry of surprise at the sight of his son, of whose arrival he was ignorant. He remained motionless, on the spot pressing with his left hand something he had concealed under his coat. Maximilian sprang down the staircase and threw his arms around his father's neck, but suddenly he recoiled and placed his right hand on Morel's breast. Father, he exclaimed, turning pale as death, what are you going to do with that brace of pistols under your coat? Oh, this is what I feared, said Morel. Father, father, in heaven's name, exclaimed the young man, what are these weapons for? Maximilian, replied Morel, looking fixedly at his son, you are a man, and a man of honour. Come, and I will explain to you. And with a firm step, Morel went up to his study, while Maximilian followed him, trembling as he went. Morel opened the door and closed it behind his son, then, crossing his anteroom, went to his desk, on which he placed the pistols, and pointed with his finger to an open ledger. In this ledger was made out an exact balance sheet of his affairs. Morel had to pay, within half an hour, 287,500 francs. All he possessed was 15,257 francs. Read, said Morel. The young man was overwhelmed as he read. Morel said not a word. What could he say? What need he add to such a desperate proof in figures? And have you done all that is possible, father, to meet this disastrous result? asked the young man after a moment's pause. I have, replied Morel. You have no money coming in on which you can rely? None. You have exhausted every resource? All. And in half an hour, said Maximilian in a gloomy voice, our name is dishonoured. Blood washes out dishonour, said Morel. You are right, father. I understand you. Then extending his hand towards one of the pistols, he said, There is one for you, and one for me. Thanks. Morel caught his hand. Your mother, your sister, who will support them? A shudder ran through the young man's frame. Father, he said, do you reflect that you are bidding me to live? Yes, I do. I do so bid you, answered Morel. It is your duty. You have a calm and strong mind, Maximilian. Maximilian, you are no ordinary man. I make no requests or commands. I only ask you to examine my position as if it were your own and then judge for yourself. The young man reflected for a moment. Then an expression of sublime resignation appeared in his eyes, and with a slow and sad gesture he took off his two epaulets, the insignia of his rank. Be it so then, my father, he said, extending his hand to Morel. Die in peace, my father. I will live. Morel was about to cast himself on his knees before his son, but Maximilian caught him in his arms, and those two noble hearts were pressed against each other for a moment. "'You know, it is not my fault,' said Morel. Maximilian smiled. "'I know, father. You are the most honourable man I have ever known.' "'Good, my son. And now there is no more to be said. Go and rejoin your mother and sister.' "'My father,' said the young man, bending his knee. Bless me. Morel took the head of his son between his two hands, drew him forward, and kissing his forehead several times, said, Oh, yes, yes, I bless you, in my own name, and in the name of three generations of irreproachable men, who say through me, The edifice which misfortune has destroyed, providence may build up again. On seeing me die such a death, the most inexorable will have pity on you. To you, perhaps, they will accord the time they have refused to me. Then do your best to keep our name free from dishonour. Go to work, labour, young man, struggle ardently and courageously, live yourself 
your mother and sister with the most rigid economy, so that from the day-to-day -day property of those whom I leave in your hands may augment and fructify. Reflect how glorious a day it will be, how grand, how solemn, that day of complete restoration on which you will say in this very office, My father died because he could not do what I have this day done, but he died calmly and peaceably, because in dying he knew what I should do. My father, my father, cried the young man, why should you not live? If I live, all would be changed. If I live, interest would be converted into doubt, pity into hostility. If I live, I am only a man who is broken his word, failed in his engagements, in fact, only a bankrupt. If, on the contrary, I die, remember, Maximilian, my corpse is that of an honest but unfortunate man. Living, my best friends would avoid my house. Dead, all Marseille will follow me in tears to my last home. Living, you would feel shame at my name. Dead, you may raise your head and say, I am the son of him you killed, because, for the first time, he has been compelled to break his word. The young man uttered a groan, but appeared resigned. And now, said Morel, leave me alone and endeavor to keep your mother and sister away. Will you not see my sister once more? asked Maximilian. A last but final hope was concealed by the young man in the effect of this interview, and therefore he had suggested it. Morel shook his head. I saw her this morning and bade her adieu. Have you no particular commands to leave with me, my father? inquired Maximilian in a faltering voice. Yes, my son, and a sacred command. Say it, my father. The house of Thompson and French is the only one who from humanity or it may be selfishness, it is not for me to read men's hearts, has had any pity for me. Its agent would in ten minutes present himself to receive the amount of a bill of 287,500 francs. I will not say granted, but offered me three months. Let this house be the first repaid, my son, and respect this man. Father, I will, said Maximilian. And now once more, adieu, said Morel. Go, leave me. I would be alone. You will find my will in the secretary in my bedroom. The young man remained standing and motionless, having but the force of will and not the power of execution. Hear me, Maximilian, said his father. Suppose I was a soldier like you, and ordered to carry a certain redoubt, and you knew I must be killed in the assault. Would you not say to me, as you said just now, Go, father, for you are dishonored by delay, and death is preferable to shame. Yes, yes, said the young man. Yes. And once again embracing his father with convulsive pressure, he said, Be it so, my father. And he rushed out of the study. When his son had left him, Morel remained an instant standing with his eyes fixed on the door. Then, putting forth his arm, he pulled the bell. After a moment's interval, Cochlea appeared. It was no longer the same man. The fearful revelations of the three last days had crushed him. This thought, the house of Borel is about to stop payment, bent him to the earth more than twenty years would otherwise have done. My worthy Cochlea, said Morel in a tone impossible to describe, do you remain in the antechamber? When the gentleman who came three months ago, the agent of Thompson and French, arrives, announce his arrival to me. Cochle made no reply. He made a sign with his head, went into the anteroom and seated himself. Morel fell back in his chair, his eyes fixed on the clock. There were seven minutes left. That was all. 
The hand moved on with incredible rapidity. He seemed to see its motion. What passed in the mind of this man at the supreme moment of his agony cannot be told in words. He was still comparatively young. He was surrounded by the loving care of a devoted family. But he had convinced himself, by a course of reasoning, illogical perhaps, yet certainly plausible, that he must separate himself from all he held dear in the world, even life itself. To form the slightest idea of his feelings, one must have seen his face with its expression of enforced resignation, and its tear-moistened eyes raised to heaven. The minute hand moved on. The pistols were loaded. He stretched forth his hand, took one up, and murmured his daughter's name. Then he laid it down, seized his pen, and wrote a few words. It seemed to him as if he had not taken a sufficient farewell of his beloved daughter. Then he turned again to the clock, counting time now, not by minutes but by seconds. He took up the deadly weapon again, his lips parted and his eyes fixed on the clock, and then shuddered at the click of the trigger as he cocked the pistol. At this moment of mortal anguish, the cold sweat came forth upon his brow. A pang stronger than death clutched at his heartstrings. He heard the door of the staircase creak on its hinges. The clock gave its warning to strike eleven. The door of his study opened. Morel did not turn around. He expected these words of Cochle, the agent of Thompson and French. He placed the muzzle of the pistol between his teeth. Suddenly he heard a cry. It was his daughter's voice. He turned and saw Julie. The pistol fell from his hands. "'My father!' cried the young girl out of breath, and half dead with joy. "'Saved! You are saved!' And she threw herself into his arms, holding in her extended hand a red netted silk purse. "'Saved, my child?' said Morel. "'What do you mean?' "'You are saved! Saved! See! See!' said the young girl. Morel took the purse and started as he did so, for a vague remembrance reminded him— that it once belonged to himself. At one end was the receipted bill for the 287,000 francs, and at the other was a diamond as large as a hazelnut, with these words on a small slip of parchment. Julie's Dowry Morel passed his hand over his brow. It seemed to him a dream. At this moment the clock struck eleven, he felt as if each, each stroke of the hammer fell upon his heart. "'Explain, my child,' he said. "'Explain, my child,' he said. "'Explain, where did you find this purse?' "'In a house, in the Allée de Meillon, numéro quinze, on the corner of a mantelpiece in a small room on the fifth floor.' "'But,' cried Morel, "'this purse is not yours.' Julie handed to her father the letter she had received in the morning. "'And did you go alone?' asked Morel after he had read it. "'Emmanuel accompanied me, father. He was to have waited for me at the corner of the Rue de Musée, but, strange to say, he was not there when I returned.' "'Monsieur Morel!' exclaimed a voice on the stairs. Uh, "'Monsieur Morel!' "'It is his voice,' said Julie. At this moment, Emmanuel entered, his countenance full of animation and joy. "'The Pharaoh!' he cried. "'The Pharaoh!' "'What? What? The Pharaoh? Are you mad, Emmanuel? You know the vessel is lost.' "'The Pharaoh, sir! They signal the Pharaoh! The Pharaoh is entering the harbour. Morel fell back in his chair. His strength was failing him. His understanding, weakened by such events, refused to comprehend such incredible, unheard-of, fabulous facts. But his son came in. Father, cried Maximilian, how could you say the pharaoh was lost? The lookout has signaled her, and they say she is now coming into port. My dear friends, said Morel, if this be so, it must be a miracle of heaven. Impossible! Impossible! 
But what was real and not less incredible was the purse he held in his hand, the acceptance receipted, the splendid diamond. Ah, oh, sir, exclaimed Cochler, what can it mean? The fair one. Come, dear ones, said Morel, rising from his seat. Let us go and see, and heaven have pity upon us if it be false intelligence. They all went out, and on the stairs met Madame Morel, who had been afraid to go up into the study. In a moment they were at the Canabière. There was a crown on the pier. All the crowd gave way before Morel. The Pharaon! The Pharaon! said every voice. And, wonderful to see, in front of the Tower of Saint-Jean was a ship bearing on her stern these words printed in white letters. The Pharaon, Morel and son of Marseille. She was the exact duplicate of the other Pharaon, and loaded as that had been with cochineal and indigo. She cast anchor, clued up sails, and on the deck was Captain Gomard giving orders, and good old Penelon making signals to Monsieur Morel. To doubt any longer was impossible. There was the evidence of the senses and ten thousand persons who came to corroborate the testimony. As Morel and his son embraced on the pier head, in the presence and amid the applause of the whole city witnessing this event, a man with his face half covered by a black beard and who concealed behind the sentry box watched the scene with delight, uttered these words in a low tone Be happy, noble heart. Be blessed for all the good thou hast done and wilt do hereafter, and let my gratitude remain in obscurity, like your good deeds. And with a smile expressive of supreme content, he left his hiding place, and without being observed, descended one of the flights of steps provided for debarkation, and hailing three times, shouted, Jacopo, Jacopo, Jacopo! Then a launch came to shore, took him on board, and conveyed him to a yacht splendidly fitted up, on whose deck he sprung with the activity of a sailor, and he once again looked towards Morel, who, weeping with joy, was shaking hands most cordially with all the crowd around him, and thanking with a look the unknown benefactor whom he seemed to be seeking in the skies. "'And now,' said the unknown, "'farewell kindness, humanity, and gratitude. Farewell to all the feelings that expand the heart. I have been heaven's substitute to recompense the good. Now the god of vengeance yields to me his power to punish the wicked.' At these words he gave a signal, and as if only waiting this signal, the yacht instantly put out to sea. End of chapter 30「Thirty One of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty One Italy Sinbad the Sailor. Towards the beginning of the year eighteen thirty eight, two young men belonging to the First Society of Paris, the Vicomte Albert de Morcerf and the Baron Franz d'Epinay, were at Florence. They had agreed to see the carnival at Rome that year and that France, who for the last three or four years had inhabited Italy, should act as Cicerone to Albert. As it is no inconsiderable affair to spend the carnival at Rome, especially when you have no great desire to sleep on the Piazza del Popolo or the Campo Vaccino, they wrote to Signor Pastrini, the proprietor of the Hotel de Londres, Piazza di Spagna, to reserve comfortable apartments for them. Signor Pastrini replied that he had only two rooms, and a parlour on the third floor, which he offered at the low charge of a Louis Pardin. They accepted this offer, but wishing to make the best use of the time that was left, Albert started for Naples. As for France, he remained at Florence, and after having passed a few days in exploring the paradise of the Caschini, and spending two or three evenings at the houses of the Florentine nobility, he took a fancy into his head, 
having already visited Corsica, the cradle of Bonaparte, to visit Elba, the waiting place of Napoleon. One evening he cast off the painter of a sailboat from the iron ring that secured it to the dock at Leghorn, wrapped himself in his coat, and lay down and said to the crew, To the island of Elba. The boat shot out of the harbour like a bird, and the next morning France disembarked at Porto Ferraio. He traversed the island after having followed the traces which the footsteps of the giant have left, and re-embarked for Marciana. Two hours after he again landed at Pianosa, where he was assured that red partridges abounded. The sport was bad, France only succeeded in killing a few partridges, and like every unsuccessful sportsman he returned to the boat very much out of temper. "'Ah, if your excellency chose,' said the captain, "'you might have capital sport. Where? Do you see that island?' continued the captain." pointing to a conical pile rising from the Indigo Sea. Well, what is this island? The island of Monte Cristo. But I have no permission to shoot over this island. Your Excellency does not require a permit, for the island is uninhabited. Ah, indeed, said the young man. A desert island in the midst of the Mediterranean must be a curiosity. It is very natural. This island is a mass of rocks, and does not contain an acre of land capable of cultivation. To whom does this island belong? To Tuscany. What game shall I find there? Thousands of wild goats. Who live upon the stones, I suppose, said Franz, with an incredulous smile. No, but by browsing the shrubs and trees that grow out of the crevices of the rocks. Where can I sleep? On shore in the grottoes or on board in your cloak. Besides, if your excellency pleases, we can leave as soon as you like. We can sail as well by night as by day. And if the wind drops, we can use our oars. As France had sufficient time and his apartments at Rome were not yet available, he accepted the proposition. Upon his answer in the affirmative, the sailors exchanged a few words together in a low tone. Well, asked he, what now? Is there any difficulty in the way? No, replied the captain, but we must warn your excellency that the island is an infected port. What do you mean? Monte Cristo although uninhabited, yet serves occasionally as a refuge for the smugglers and pirates who come from Corsica, Sardinia, and Africa. And if it becomes known that we have been there, we shall have to perform a quarantine for six days on our return to Leghorn. The juice, that puts a different face on the matter. Six days? Why, that's as long as the Almighty took to make the world. Too long I wait. Too long. But who will say your excellency has been to Monte Cristo? Oh, I shall not, cried Franz. Nor I, nor I, chorused the sailors. Then steer for Monte Cristo. The captain gave his orders. The helm was put up, and the boat was soon sailing in the direction of the island. Franz waited until all was in order and when the sail was filled and the four sailors had taken their places, three forward and one at the helm, he resumed the conversation. Gaetano, said he to the captain, you tell me Monte Cristo serves as a refuge for pirates, who are, it seems to me, a very different kind of game from the goats. Yes, your excellency, and it is true. I knew there were smugglers, but I thought that since the capture of Algier, and the destruction of the Regency, pirates existed only in the romances of Cooper and Captain Marriott. Your Excellency is mistaken. There are pirates like the bandits, who were believed to have been exterminated by Pope Leo XII, and who yet every day rob travellers at the gates of Rome. Has not Your Excellency heard that the French charge d'affaires was robbed six months ago with five hundred paces of velletry. Oh, yes, I heard that. 
Well then, if, like us, your excellency lived at Leghorn, you would hear from time to time that a little merchant vessel or an English yacht that was expected at Bastia, at Porto Ferraio, or at Civita Vecchia, has not arrived, no one knows what has become of it. But doubtless it has struck on a rock and foundered. Now this rock it has met has been a long and narrow boat, manned by six or eight men, who have surprised and plundered it. Some dark and stormy night near some desert and gloomy island as bandits plunder a carriage in the recesses of a forest. But, asked Franz, who lay wrapped in his cloak at the bottom of the boat, why do not those who have been plundered complain to the French, Sardinian, of Tuscan governments? Why? said Gaetano with a smile. Yes, why? Because in the first place they transfer from the vessel to their own boat whatever they think worth taking. Then they bind the crew hand and foot. They attach to everyone's neck a four-and-twenty-pound ball. A large hole is chopped in the vessel's bottom, and then they leave her. At the end of ten minutes, the vessel begins to roll heavily and settle down. First one gun goes under, then the other. Then they lift and sink again, and both go under at once. All at once there's a noise like a cannon. That's the air blowing up the deck. Soon the water rushes out of the scupper holes like a whale spouting. The vessel gives a last groan, spins around around and disappears, forming a vast whirlpool in the ocean. And then all is over so that in five minutes nothing but the eye of God can see the vessel where she lies at the bottom of the sea. Do you understand now? said the captain. Why no complaints are made to the government and why the vessel never reaches port? It is probable that if Gaetano had related the previous to proposing the expedition, Franz would have hesitated. But now that they had started, he thought it would be cowardly to draw back. He was one of those men who do not rashly court danger. But if danger presents itself, combat it with the most unalterable coolness. Calm and resolute, he treated any peril as he would an adversary in a duel, calculated its probable method of approach, retreated, if at all, as a point of strategy, and not from cowardice, was quick to see an opening for attack, and won victory at a single thrust. Bah, said he, I have travelled through Sicily and Calabria, I have sailed two months in the archipelago, and yet I never saw even the shadow of a bandit or a pirate. I did not tell your excellency this to deter you from your project, replied Gaetano. But you questioned me, and I have answered, that's all. Yes, and your conversation is most interesting, and as I wish to enjoy it as long as possible, steer for Monte Cristo. The wind blew strongly. The boat made six or seven knots an hour, and they were rapidly reaching the end of their voyage. As they drew near, the island seemed to lift from the sea, and the air was so clear that they could already distinguish the rocks heaped on one another, like cannonballs in an arsenal, with green bushes and trees growing in the crevices. As for the sailors, although they appeared perfectly tranquil, yet it was evident that they were on the alert, and that they carefully watched the glassy surface over which they were sailing, and on which a few fishing boats, with their white sails, were alone visible. They were within fifteen miles of Monte Cristo, when the sun began to set behind Corsica, whose mountains appeared against the sky, showing their rugged peaks in bold relief. This mass of rock, like the giant Adamastor, rose dead ahead, a formidable barrier, and intercepting the light that gilded its massive peaks, so that the voyagers were in shadow. Little by little, the shadow rose higher, and seemed to drive before it the last rays of the expiring day. At last, the reflection rested on the summit of the mountain, where it paused an instant, like the fiery crest of a volcano. Then gloom gradually covered the summit, as it had covered the base, and the island now only appeared to be a grey mountain that grew continually darker. Half an hour after, the night was quite dark. Fortunately, the mariners were used to these latitudes, and knew every rock in the Tuscan archipelago. 
for in the midst of this obscurity France was not without uneasiness. Corsica had long since disappeared, and Monte Cristo itself was invisible. But the sailors seemed like the lynx to see in the dark, and the pilot who steered did not evince the slightest hesitation. An hour had passed since the sun had set, when Franz fancied he saw at a quarter of a mile to the left a dark mass, but he could not precisely make out what it was, and fearing to excite the mirth of the sailors by mistaking a floating cloud for land, he remained silent. Suddenly a great light appeared on the strand. Land might resemble a cloud, but the fire was not a meteor. "'What is this light?' asked he. Ush, said the captain, it is a fire. But you told me the island was uninhabited. I said there were no fixed habitations on it, but I said also that it served sometimes as a harbour for smugglers. And for pirates? And for pirates, returned Gaetano, repeating Franz's words. It is for that reason I have given orders to pass the island, for, as you see, the fire is behind us. But this fire, continued Franz, it seems to me rather reassuring than otherwise. Men who did not wish to be seen would not light a fire. Oh, that goes for nothing, said Gaetano. If you can guess the position of the island in the darkness, you will see that the fire cannot be seen from the side or from Pianosa but only from the sea. You think, then, this fire indicates the presence of unpleasant neighbours? That is what we must find out, returned Gaetano, fixing his eyes on this terrestrial star. How can you find out? You shall see, Gaetano consulted with his companions, and after five minutes' discussion, a manoeuvre was executed which caused the vessel to tack about. They returned the way they had come, and in a few minutes the fire disappeared, hidden by an elevation of the land. The pilot again changed the course of the boat, which rapidly approached the island, and was soon within fifty paces of it. Gaetano lowered the sail, and the boat came to rest. All this was done in silence, and from the moment that their course was changed, not a word was spoken. Gaetano, who had proposed the expedition, had taken all the responsibility on himself. The four sailors fixed their eyes on him, while they got out their oars and held themselves in readiness to row away, which, thanks to the darkness, would not be difficult. As for Franz, he examined his arms with the utmost coolness. He had two double-barrelled guns and a rifle. He loaded them, looking at the priming, and waited quietly. During this time the captain had thrown off his vest and shirt, and secured his trousers round his waist. His feet were naked, so he had no shoes and stockings to take off. After these preparations he placed his finger on his lips, and lowering himself noiselessly into the sea, swam towards the shore with such precaution that it was impossible to hear the slightest sound. He could only be traced by the phosphorescent line in his wake. This track soon disappeared. It was evident that he had touched the shore. Everyone on board remained motionless for half an hour, when the same luminous track was again observed, and the swimmer was soon on board. "'Well!' exclaimed Franz and the sailors in unison. "'They are Spanish smugglers,' said he. "'They have with them two Corsican bandits.' "'And what are these Corsican bandits doing here with the Spanish smugglers?' Alas, sir, returned the captain with an accent of the most profound pity, we ought always to help one another. Very often the bandits are hard pressed by the gendarme or cabiniere. Well, they see a vessel and good fellows like us on board, they come and demand hospitality of us. You can't refuse help to a poor hunted devil. We receive them, and for greater security we stand out to sea. This costs us nothing, and saves the life, or at least the liberty, of a fellow creature, who on the first occasion returns the service by pointing out some safe spot where we can land our goods without interruption. Ah, said Franz, then you are a smuggler occasionally, Gattano. 
Your Excellency. We must leave her somehow, returned the other, smiling impenetrably. Then you know the men who are now on Monte Cristo? Oh, yes, sir. We sailors are like Freemasons, and recognize each other by signs. And do you think we have nothing to fear if we land? Nothing at all. Smugglers are not thieves. But these two Corsican bandits, said Franz, calculating the chances of peril. It is not their fault that they are bandits, but that of the authorities. How so? Because they are pursued for having made a stiff, as if it was not in Corsican's nature to revenge himself. And what do you mean by having made a stiff? Having assassinated a man? said Franz, continuing his investigation. I mean that they have killed an enemy, which is a very different thing, returned the captain. Well, said the young man, let us demand hospitality of these smuggler and bandits. Do you think they will grant it? Without a doubt. How many are they? Four, and the two bandits make a six. Just our number, so that if they prove troublesome, we shall be able to hold them in check. So for the last time, steer to Monte Cristo. Yes, but your excellency will permit us to take all due precautions. By all means, be as wise as Nestor and as prudent as Ulysses. I do more than permit. I exhort you. Silence, then, said Gaetano. Everyone obeyed. For a man who, like Franz, viewed his position in its true light, it was a grave one. He was alone in the darkness, with sailors whom he did not know, and who had no reason to be devoted to him, who knew that he had several thousand francs in his belt, and who had often examined his weapons, which were very beautiful, if not with envy, at least with curiosity. On the other hand, he was about to land without any other escort than these men on an island which had indeed a very religious name, but which did not seem to France likely to afford him much hospitality, thanks to the smugglers and bandits. The history of the scuttled vessels which had appeared improbable during the day seemed very probable at night. Placed as he was between two possible sources of danger, he kept his eye on the crew and his gun in his hand. The sailors had again hoisted sail, and the vessel was once more cleaving the waves. Through the darkness, Franz, whose eyes were now more accustomed to it, could see the looming shore along which the boat was sailing, and then, as they rounded a rocky point, he saw the fire more brilliant than ever, and about it five or six persons seated. The blaze illumined the sea for a hundred paces around. Gaetano skirted the light, carefully keeping the boat in the shadow. Then, when they were opposite the fire, he steered to the centre of the circle, singing a fishing song, of which his companions sung the chorus. At the first words of the song, the men seated round the fire arose and approached the landing place, their eyes fixed on the boat, evidently seeking to know who the newcomers were and what were their intentions. They soon appeared satisfied and returned, with the exception of one, who remained at the shore to their fire, at which the carcass of a goat was roasting. When the boat was within twenty paces of the shore, the man on the beach, who carried a carbine, presented arms after the manner of a sentinel, and cried, "'Who comes here?' in Sardinian. Franz coolly cocked both barrels. A Gaetano then exchanged a few words with this man, which the traveller did not understand, but which evidently concerned him. "'Will your excellency give your name, or remain incognito?' asked the captain. "'My name must rest unknown. Merely say I am a Frenchman, travelling for pleasure.' As soon as Gaetano had transmitted this answer, the sentinel gave an order to one of the men seated round the fire, who rose and disappeared among the rocks. Not a word was spoken. Everyone seemed occupied. France, with his disembarkment, the sailors with their sails, the smugglers with their goat. But in the midst of all this carelessness it was evident that they mutually observed each other. The man who had disappeared 
returned suddenly on the opposite side to that by which he had left. He made a sign with his head to the sentinel, who, turning to the boat, said, Saccomodi. The Italian Saccomodi is untranslatable. It means at once. Come, enter. You are welcome. And make yourself at home. You are the master. It is like that Turkish phrase of Moliere's that so astonished the bourgeois gentleman by the number of things implied in its utterance. The sailors did not wait for a second invitation. Four strokes of the oar brought them to land. Gaetano sprang to shore, exchanged a few words with the sentinel, then his comrades disembarked, and lastly came France. One of his guns was swung over his shoulder. Gaetano had the other, and the sailor held his rifle, his dress, half artist, half dandy, did not excite any suspicion, and consequently no disquietude. The boat was moored to the shore, and they advanced a few paces to find a comfortable bivouac. But doubtless, the spot they chose did not suit the smuggler, who filled the post of sentinel, for he cried out, Not that way, if you please. Gaetano faltered an excuse, and advanced to the opposite side, while two sailors kindled torches at the fire to light them on their way. They advanced about thirty paces, and then stopped at a small esplanade surrounded with rock in which seats had been cut, not unlike sentry-boxes. Around in the crevices of the rocks grew a few dwarf oaks and thick bushes of myrtles. Franz lowered a torch and saw by the mass of cinders that had accumulated that he was not the first to discover this retreat, which was doubtless one of the halting places of the wandering visitors of Monte Cristo. As for his suspicions, once on terra firma, once that he had seen the indifferent, if not friendly, appearance of his hosts, his anxiety had quite disappeared, or rather, at sight of the goat, had turned to appetite. He mentioned this to Gaetano, who replied that nothing could be more easy than to prepare a supper when they had in their boat bread, wine, half a dozen partridges, and a good fire to roast them by. Besides, added he, if the smell of their roast to meat tempts you, I would go and offer them two of our birds for a slice. You are a born diplomat, returned Franz. Go and try. Meanwhile the sailors had collected dried sticks and branches with which they made a fire. Franz waited impatiently, inhaling the aroma of the roasted meat, when the captain returned with a mysterious air. Well, said Franz, anything new? Do they refuse? "'On the contrary,' returned Gaetano. "'The chief, who was told you were a younger Frenchman, "'invites you to supper with him.' "'Well,' observed Franz, "'this chief is very polite, and I see no objection. "'The more so as I bring my share of the supper.' "'Oh, it is not that. "'He has plenty, and to spare for supper. "'But he makes one condition.' and rather a peculiar one before he will receive you at his house. His house? Has he built one here, then? No, but he has a very comfortable one all the same, so they say. You know this chief, then? I have heard to talk of him. Favourable or otherwise? Both. The deuce, and what is this condition? "'that you are blindfolded and do not take off the bandage until he himself bids you.' Franz looked at Gaetano to see, if possible, what he thought of this proposal. "'Ah,' replied he, guessing Franz's thought, "'I know this is a serious matter. "'What should you do in my place? "'I, who have nothing to lose, I should go. "'You would accept it? "'Yes, were it only out of curiosity. "'There is something very peculiar about this chief, then.' "'Listen,' said Gaetano, lowering his voice. "'I do not know if what they say is true.' "'He stopped to see if anyone was near. "'What do they say?' "'That this chief inhabits a cavern, "'to which the pity palace is nothing.' "'What nonsense!' said Franz, reseating himself. "'It is a no nonsense. It is quite true. Kama, the pilot of the St. Ferdinand, went in once, and he came back amazed, 
vowing that such treasures were only to be heard of in fairy tales. "'Do you know,' observed Franz, "'that with such stories you make me think of Ali Baba's enchanted cavern. "'I tell you what I have been told. "'Then you advise me to accept?' Oh, I didn't say that your Excellency will do as you please. I should be sorry to advise you in the matter. Franz pondered the matter for a few moments, concluded that a man so rich could not have any intention of plundering him of what little he had, and seeing only the prospect of a good supper, accepted. Gaetano departed with the reply. Franz was prudent and wished to learn all he possibly could concerning his host. He turned towards the sailor, who, during this dialogue, had sat gravely plucking the partridges with the air of a man proud of his office, and asking him how these men had landed, as no vessel of any kind was visible. "'Never mind that,' returned the sailor. "'I know their vessel.' "'Is it a very beautiful vessel?' "'I would not wish for a bet to sail around the world.' "'Of what burden is she?' "'About a hundred tons, but she is built to stand any weather. "'She is what the English call a yacht. "'Where was she built?' "'I know not, but my own opinion is she is a Genoese.' "'And how did a leader of smugglers,' continued Franz, "'venture to build a vessel designed for such a purpose at Genoa? "'I did not say that the owner was a smuggler,' replied the sailor. No, but Gaetano did, I thought. Gaetano had only seen the vessel from a distance. He had not then spoken to anyone. And if this person be not a smuggler, who is he? A wealthy signor who travels for his pleasure. Come, thought Franz. He is still more mysterious, since the two accounts do not agree. What is his name? If you ask him, he says Sinbad the Sailor, but I doubt if it be his real name. Sinbad the Sailor? Yes. And where does he reside? On the sea. What country does he come from? I do not know. Have you ever seen him? Sometimes. What sort of man is he? Your Excellency will judge for yourself. Where will he receive me? No doubt in the subterranean palace Gatano told you of. Have you never had the curiosity, when you have landed, and found this island deserted, to seek for this enchanted palace? Oh yes, more than once, but always in vain. We examined the grotto all over, but we could never find the slightest trace of any opening. They say that the door is not opened by a key. "'but a magic word.' "'Decidedly,' muttered Franz, "'this is an Arabian night's adventure.' "'His Excellency awaits you,' said a voice, "'which he recognised as that of the sentinel. "'He was accompanied by two of the yacht's crew. "'Franz drew his handkerchief from his pocket "'and presented it to the man who had spoken to him. Without uttering a word, they bandaged his eyes with a care that showed their apprehension of his committing some indiscretion. Afterwards, he was made to promise that he would not make the least attempt to raise the bandage. He promised. Then his two guides took his arms, and he went on, guided by them, and preceded by the sentinel. After going about thirty paces, he smelt the appetizing odour of the kid that was roasting, and knew thus that he was passing the bivouac. They then led him on about fifty paces farther, evidently advancing towards that part of the shore where they would not allow Gaetano to go, a refusal he could now comprehend. Presently, by a change in the atmosphere, he knew that they were entering a cave. After going on for a few seconds more, he heard a crackling, and it seemed to him as though the atmosphere again changed and became balmy and perfumed. At length his feet touched on a thick and soft carpet and his guides let go their hold of him. There was a moment's silence, and then a voice in excellent French, although with a foreign accent, said, "'Welcome, sir. I beg you will remove your bandage.' 
It may be supposed, then, France did not wait for a repetition of this permission, but took off the handkerchief and found himself in the presence of a man, from thirty-eight to forty years of age, dressed in a Tunisian costume, that is to say, a red cap with a long blue silk tassel, a vest of black cloth embroidered with gold, pantaloons of deep red, large and full gaiters of the same colour, embroidered with gold like the vest, and yellow slippers. He had a splendid cashmere around his waist, and a small, sharp, and crooked kanjar was passed through his girdle. Although of a paleness that was almost livid, this man had a remarkably handsome face. His eyes were penetrating and sparkling. His nose, quite straight and projecting direct from the brow, was of the pure Greek type, while his teeth, as white as pearls, were set off to admiration by the black moustache that encircled them. His pallor was so peculiar that it seemed to pertain to one who had been long entombed, and who was incapable of resuming the healthy glow and hue of life. He was not particularly tall, but extremely well made, and, like the men of the South, had small hands and feet. But what astonished France, who had treated Gaetano's description as a fable, was the splendour of the apartment in which he found himself. The entire chamber was lined with crimson brocade, worked with flowers of gold. In a recess was a kind of divan, surmounted with a stand of Arabian swords in silver scabbards, and the handles resplendent with gems. From the ceiling hung a lamp of Venetian glass, of beautiful shape and colour, while the feet rested on a turkey carpet in which they sunk to the instep. Tapestry hung before the door by which France had entered, and also in front of another door, leading into a second apartment which seemed to be brilliantly illuminated. The host gave France time to recover from his surprise, and moreover returned look for look, not even taking his eyes off him. Sir, he said after a pause, a thousand excuses for the precautions taken in your introduction hither. But as, during the greater portion of the year, this island is deserted, if the secret of this abode were discovered, I should doubtless find on my return my temporary retirement in a state of great disorder, which would be exceedingly annoying, not for the loss it occasioned me, but because I should not have the certainty I now possess of separating myself from all the rest of mankind at pleasure. Let me now endeavour to make you forget this temporary unpleasantness, and offer you what no doubt you did not expect to find here, that is to say, a tolerable supper, and pretty comfortable beds. Ma foi, my dear sir, replied France, make no apologies. I have always observed that they bandage people's eyes who penetrate enchanted palaces. For instance, those of Raoul in Huguenot, and really I have nothing to complain of, for what I see makes me think of the wonders of the Arabian Nights. Alas, I may say with Lucullus, if I could have anticipated the honour of your visit, I would have prepared for it. But such as is my hermitage, it is at your disposal, such as is my supper, it is yours to share, if you will. Ali, is the supper ready? At this moment the tapestry moved aside, and a Nubian, black as ebony and dressed in a plain white tunic, made a sign to his master that all was prepared in the dining-room. Now, said the unknown to France, I do not know if you are of my opinion, but I think nothing is more annoying than to remain two or three hours together without knowing by name or appellation how to address one another. Pray observe that I too must respect the laws of hospitality to ask your name or title. I only request you to give me one by which I may have the pleasure of addressing you. As for myself, that I may put you at your ease, I tell you that I am generally called Sinbad the Sailor. And I, replied Franz, will tell you, as I only require this wonderful lamp to make me precisely like Aladdin, that I see no reason why at this moment I should not be called Aladdin. That will keep us from going away from the east whither I am tempted to think I have been conveyed by some good genius. Well then, Signor Aladdin, 
replied the singular Amphitryon. You heard our repast announced. Will you now take the trouble to enter the dining room, your humble servant going first, to show the way? At these words, moving aside the tapestry, Simbad preceded his guest. Franz now looked upon another scene of enchantment. The table was splendidly covered, and once convinced of this important point, he cast his eyes around him. The dining room was scarcely less striking than the room he had just left. It was entirely of marble, with antique bas-relief of priceless value, and at the four corners of his apartment, which was oblong, were four magnificent statues, having baskets in their hands. These baskets contained four pyramids of most splendid fruit. There were Sicily pine apples, pomegranates from Malaga, oranges from the Balearic Islands, peaches from France, and dates from Tunis. The supper consisted of a, a roast pheasant garnished with Corsican blackbirds, a boar's ham with jelly, a quarter of a kid with tartar sauce, a glorious turbot, and a gigantic lobster. Between these large dishes were smaller ones containing various dainties. The dishes were of silver, and the plates of Japanese china. Franz rubbed his eyes in order to assure himself that this was not a dream. Ali alone was present to wait at table and acquitted himself so admirably that the guest complimented his host thereupon. "'Yes,' replied he, while he did the honours of the supper with much ease and grace. "'Yes, he is a poor devil who is much devoted to me, and does all he can to prove it. He remembers that I saved his life, and, as he has a regard for his head, he feels some gratitude towards me for having kept it on his shoulders.' Ali approached his master, took his hand, and kissed it. "'Would it be impertinent, uh, Signor Simbad,' said Franz, "'to ask you the particulars of this kindness?' "'Oh, they are simple enough,' replied the host. "'It seems the fellow had been caught wandering nearer to the harem of the Bay of Tunis "'than etiquette permits to one of his colour, "'and he was condemned by the Bay to have his tongue cut out "'and his hand and head cut off.' the tongue the first day, the hand the second, and the head the third. I always had a desire to have a mute in my service, so learning the day his tongue was cut out, I went to the bay and proposed to give him for Ali a splendid double-barrelled gun which I knew he was very desirous of having. He hesitated a moment. He was so very desirous to complete the poor devil's punishment. But when I added to the gun an English cutlass, with which I had shivered His Highness's yatagan to pieces, the bay yielded and agreed to forgive the hand and head, but on condition that the poor fellow never again set foot in Tunis. This was a useless clause in the bargain, for whenever the coward sees the first glimpse of the shores of Africa, he runs down below and can only be induced to appear again when we're out of sight of that quarter of the globe. France remained a moment silent and pensive, hardly knowing what to think of the half-kindness, half-cruelty with which his host related the brief narrative. "'And like the celebrated sailor, whose name you have assumed,' he said, by way of changing the conversation, "'you pass your life in travelling. "'Yes, I made a vow at a time when I little thought I should ever be able to accomplish it,' said the unknown with a singular smile." and I made some others also which I hope I may fulfil in due season. Although Sinbad pronounced these words with such calmness, his eyes gave forth gleams of extraordinary ferocity. "'You have suffered a great deal, sir,' said Franz inquiringly. Sinbad started and looked fixedly at him as he replied, "'What makes you suppose so?' "'Every thing,' answered Franz. "'Your voice, your look.' your pallid complexion, and even the life you lead. I? I live the happiest life possible, the real life of a pasha. I am king of all creation. I am pleased with one place and stay there. I get tired of it and leave it. I am free as a bird and have wings like one. My attendants obey my slightest wish. Sometimes I amuse myself by delivering some bandit or criminal from the bonds of the law. Then I have my mode of dispensing justice, silent and sure, without respite or appeal, which condemns or pardons and which no one sees. Ah, if you had tasted my life, 
you would not desire any other and would never return to the world unless you had some great project to accomplish there. Revenge, for instance, observed Franz. The unknown fixed on the young man one of those looks which penetrates into the depths of the heart and thoughts. And why revenge? he asked. Because, replied Franz, you seem to me like a man who, persecuted by society, has a fearful account to settle with it. Ah, responded Sinbad, laughing with his singular laugh which displayed his white and sharp teeth, <laughs> you have not guessed rightly. Such as you see me, I am a sort of philosopher, and one day perhaps I shall go to Paris to rival Monsieur Appert and the little man in the blue cloak. And will that be the first time you ever took that journey? Yes, it will. I must seem to you by no means curious, but I assure you that it is not my fault I have delayed it so long. It will happen one day or the other. And you propose to make this journey very shortly? I do not know. It depends on circumstances which depend on certain arrangements. I should like to be there at the time you come, and I will endeavour to repay you as far as lies in my power for your liberal hospitality displayed to me at Monte Cristo. I should avail myself of your offer with pleasure, replied the host, but unfortunately if I go there it will be in all probability incognito. The supper appeared to have been supplied solely for France, for the unknown scarcely touched one or two dishes of the splendid banquet to which his guest did ample justice. Then Ali brought on the dessert, or rather took the baskets from the hands of the statues and placed them on the table. Between the two baskets he placed a small silver cup with a silver cover. The care with which Ali placed this cup on the table roused France's curiosity. He raised the cover and saw a kind of greenish paste, something like preserved angelica, but which was perfectly unknown to him. He replaced the lid, as ignorant of what the cup contained as he was before he had looked at it, and then casting his eyes towards his host, he saw him smile at his disappointment. "'You cannot guess,' said he, "'what there is in that small vase, can you?' "'No, I really cannot.' Well, then, that green preserve is nothing less than the ambrosia which Hebe served at the table of Jupiter. But, replied Franz, this ambrosia, no doubt, in passing through mortal hands, has lost its heavenly appellation and assumed our human name. In vulgar phrase, what may you term this composition, for which, to tell the truth, I do not feel any particular desire. Ah, thus it is that our material origin is revealed, cried Simbad. We frequently pass so near to happiness without seeing, without regarding it, or if we do see and regard it, yet without recognising it. Are you a man for the substantials, and is gold your god? Taste this, and the mines of Peru, Guzerat, and Golconda are open to you. Are you a man of imagination, a poet? Taste this, and the boundaries of possibility disappear. The fields of infinite space open to you. You advance free in heart, free in mind, into the boundless realms of unfettered reverie. Are you ambitious, and do you seek after the greatness of the earth? Taste this, and in an hour you will be a king, not a king of a petty kingdom hidden in some corner of Europe, like France, Spain, or England, but king of the world, king of the universe, king of creation, without bowing at the feet of Satan, you will be king and master of all the kingdoms of the earth. Is it not tempting what I offer you? And is it not an easy thing, since it is only to do thus? Look! At these words he uncovered the small cup which contained the substance so lauded, took a teaspoonful of the magic sweetmeat, raised it to his lips, and swallowed it slowly, with his eyes half shut and his head bent backwards. France did not disturb him whilst he absorbed his favourite sweetmeat, but when he had finished he inquired, 
What then is this precious stuff? Did you ever hear, he replied, of the old man of the mountain who attempted to assassinate Philippe Augustus? Of course I have. Well, you know, he reigned over a rich valley which was overhung by the mountain whence he derived his picturesque name. In this valley were magnificent gardens planted by Hassan ben Sabah, and in these gardens isolated pavilions. Into these pavilions he admitted the elect, and there, says Marco Polo, gave them to eat a certain herb, which transported them to paradise in the midst of ever-blooming shrubs, ever-ripe fruit, and ever-lovely virgins. What these happy persons took for reality was but a dream. But it was a dream so soft, so voluptuous, so enthralling, that they sold themselves body and soul to him who gave it to them, and obedient to his orders, as to those of a deity, struck down the designated victim, died in torture without a murmur, believing that the death they underwent was but a quick transition to that life of delights, of which the holy herb now before you had given them a slight foretaste. Then, cried Franz, it is hashish. I know that, by name at least. That is it precisely, Signor Aladdin. It is hashish, the purest and most unadulterated hashish of Alexandria, the hashish of Abu Ghor, the celebrated maker, the only man, the man to whom there should be built a palace inscribed with these words, a grateful word to the dealer in happiness. Do you know, said Franz, I have a very great inclination to judge for myself of the truth or exaggeration of your eulogies. Judge for yourself, Signor Aladdin. Judge, but do not confine yourself to one trial. Like everything else, we must habituate the senses to a fresh impression, gentle or violent, sad or joyous. There is a struggle in nature against this divine substance. In nature which is not made for joy and clings to pain, nature subdued must yield in the combat. The dream must succeed to reality, and then the dream reigns supreme. Then the dream becomes life, and life becomes the dream. But what changes occur? It is only by comparing the pains of actual being with the joys of the assumed existence that you would desire to live no longer, but to dream thus forever. When you return to this mundane sphere from your visionary world, you would seem to leave a Neapolitan spring for a Lapland winter, to quit paradise for earth, heaven for hell. Taste the hashish, guest of mine, taste the hashish. Francis' only reply was to take a teaspoonful of the marvellous preparation about as much in quantity as his host had eaten, and lift it to his mouth. Diable, he said, after having swallowed the divine preserve, I do not know if the result will be as agreeable as you describe, but the thing does not appear to me as palatable as you say. Because your palate has not yet been attuned to the sublimity of the substances it flavours, tell me the first time you tasted oysters, tea, porter, truffles, and sundry other dainties which you now adore. Did you like them? Could you comprehend how the Romans stuff their pheasants with asafoetida, and the Chinese eat swallows? Nests? Eh? No. Well, it's the same with hashish. Only eat for a week, and nothing in the world will seem to you to equal the delicacy of its flavour, which now appears to you flat and distasteful. Let us now go into the adjoining chamber, which is your apartment, and Ali will bring us coffee and pipes. They both arose, and while he who called himself Sinbad, and whom we have occasionally named so that we might, like his guest, have some title by which to distinguish him, gave some orders to the servant, Franz entered still another apartment. It was simply yet richly furnished. It was round, and a large divan completely encircled it. Divan, walls, ceiling, floor, were all covered with magnificent skins as soft and downy as the richest carpets. There were heavy-maned lion-skins from Atlas, striped tiger-skins from Bengal, 
panther skins from the cape, spotted beautifully like those that appeared to Dante, bear skins from Siberia, fox skins from Norway, and so on. And all these skins were strewn in profusion, one on the other, so that it seemed like walking over the most mossy turf, or reclining on the most luxurious bed. Both laid themselves down on the divan, chibuk and jasmine tubes and amber mouthpieces were within reach, and all prepared so that there was no need to smoke the same pipe twice. Each of them took one, which Ali lighted and then retired to prepare the coffee. There was a moment's silence, during which Sinbad gave himself up to thoughts that seemed to occupy him incessantly, even in the midst of his conversation, and Franz abandoned himself to that mute reverie into which we always sink when smoking excellent tobacco, which seems to remove with its fume all the troubles of the mind, and to give the smoker in exchange all the visions of the soul. Ali brought in the coffee. "'How do you take it?' inquired the unknown. "'In French or Turkish style? Strong or weak? Sugar or non? Cool or boiling? As you please. It's ready in all ways.' "'I'll take it in the Turkish style,' replied Franz. "'And you are right,' said his host. It shows you have a tendency for an oriental life. Ah, those orientals. They're the only men who know how to live. As for me, he added, with one of those singular smiles which did not escape the young man, when I have completed my affairs in Paris, I shall go and die in the East. And should you wish to see me again, you must seek me at Cairo, Baghdad, or Ispahan. Ma foi, said Franz. It would be the easiest thing in the world, for I feel eagle's wings springing out my shoulders, and with those wings I could make a tour of the world in four and twenty hours. Ah, yes, the hashish is beginning its work. Well, unfurl your wings and fly into superhuman regions. Fear nothing. There is a watch over you, and if your wings, like those of Icarus, melt before the sun, we are here to ease your fall. He then said something in Arabic to Ali, who made a sign of obedience and withdrew, but not to any distance. As to France, a strange transformation had taken place in him. All the bodily fatigue of the day, all the preoccupation of mind which the events of the evening had brought on, disappeared as they do at the first approach of sleep, when we are still sufficiently conscious to be aware of the coming of slumber. His body seemed to acquire an airy lightness, his perception brightened in a remarkable manner. His senses seemed to redouble their power. The horizon continued to expand, but it was not the gloomy horizon of vague alarms, and which he had seen before he slept, but a blue, transparent, unbounded horizon, with all the blue of the ocean, all the spangles of the sun, all the perfumes of the summer breeze. Then, in the midst of the songs of his sailors, songs so clear and sonorous, that they would have made a divine harmony had their notes been taken down, he saw the island of Monte Cristo, no longer as a threatening rock in the midst of the waves, but as an oasis in the desert. Then, as his boat drew nearer, the songs became louder, for an enchanting and mysterious harmony rose to heaven, as if some Lorelei had decreed to attract the soul thither, or Amphion the enchanter, intended there to build a city. At length the boat touched the shore, but without effort, without shock, as lips touch lips, and he entered the grotto amidst continued strains of most delicious melody. He descended, or rather seemed to descend, several steps, inhaling the fresh and balmy air, like that which may be supposed to reign around the grotto of Circe, formed from such perfumes as set the mind a-dreaming, and such fires as burn the very senses. And he saw again all he had seen before his sleep from Sinbad, his singular host, to Ali, the mute attendant, then all seemed to fade away, and become confused before his eyes, like the last shadows of the magic lantern before it is extinguished. And he was again in the chamber of statues, lighted only by one of those pale and antique lamps which watch in the dead of the night over the sleep of pleasure. 
They were the same statues, rich in form, in attraction and poesy, with eyes of fascination, smiles of love and bright and flowing hair. They were Frine, Cleopatra, Messalina, those three celebrated courtesans. Then among them glided like a pure ray, like a Christian angel in the midst of Olympus, one of those chaste figures, those calm shadows, those soft visions, which seemed to veil its virgin brow before those marble wantons. Then the three statues advanced towards him with looks of love, and approached the couch on which he was reposing, their feet hidden in their long white tunics, their throats bare, hair flowing like waves and assuming attitudes which the gods could not resist, but which saints withstood, and looks inflexible and ardent like those which the serpent charms the bird. And then he gave way before looks that held him in a torturing grasp and delighted his senses as with a voluptuous kiss. It seemed to France that he closed his eyes and in a last look about him saw the vision of modesty completely veiled and then followed a dream of passion like that promised by the prophet to the elect. Lips of stone turned to flame, breasts of ice became like heated lava, so that to France, yielding for the first time to the sway of the drug, love was a sorrow and voluptuousness a torture, as burning mouths were pressed to his thirsty lips, and he was held in cool, serpent-like embraces. The more he strove against this unhallowed passion, the more his senses yielded to its thrall, and at length, weary of a struggle that taxed his very soul, he gave way, and sank back breathless and exhausted beneath the kisses of these marble goddesses and the enchantment of his marvellous dream. End of chapter 31「Chapter 32 of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 32 The Waking When Franz returned to himself, he seemed still to be in a dream. He thought himself in a sepulchre into which a ray of sunlight in pity scarcely penetrated. He stretched forth his hand and touched stone. He rose to his seat, and found himself lying on his bornus in a bed of dry heather, very soft and odoriferous. The vision had fled, and as if the statues had been but shadows from the tomb, they had vanished at his waking. He advanced several paces towards the point whence the light came, and to all the excitement of his dream succeeded the calmness of reality. He found that he was in a grotto, went towards the opening, and through a kind of fanlight saw a blue sea and an azure sky. The air and water were shining in the beams of the morning sun. On the shore the sailors were sitting, chatting and laughing, and at ten yards from them the boat was at anchor, undulating gracefully on the water. There for some time he enjoyed the fresh breeze which played on his brow, and listened to the dash of the waves on the beach that left against the rocks a lace of foam as white as silver. He was for some time without reflection or thought for the divine charm which is in the things of nature, especially after a fantastic dream. Then gradually this view of the outer world, so calm, so pure, so grand, reminded him of the elusiveness of his vision, and once more awakened memory. He recalled his arrival on the island, his presentation to a smuggler chief, a subterranean palace full of splendour, an excellent supper, and a spoonful of hashish. It seemed, however, even in the very face of open day, that at least a year had elapsed since all these things had passed, so deep was the impression made in his mind by the dream, and so strong a hold had it taken over his imagination. Thus, every now and then, he saw in fancy amid sailors, seated on a rock or undulating in the vessel, one of the shadows which had shared his dream with looks and kisses, Otherwise his head was perfectly clear, and his body refreshed. He was free from the slightest headache. On the contrary, he felt a certain degree of lightness, 
a faculty for absorbing the pure air and enjoying the bright sunshine more vividly than ever. He went gaily up to the sailors, who rose as soon as they perceived him, and the patron, accosting him, said, The Signor Sinbad has left his compliments for your excellency, and desires us to express the regret he feels at not being able to take his leave in a person. But he trusts you will excuse him, as very important business calls him to Malaga. So then, Gaetano, said Franz, this is then all reality. There exists a man who has received me in this island, entertained me right royally, and is departed while I was asleep. He exists as certainly as that you may see his small yacht with all her sails spread, and if you will use your glass, you will in all probability recognize your host in the midst of his crew. So saying, Gaetano pointed in a direction in which a small vessel was making sail towards the southern point of Corsica. Franz adjusted his telescope and directed it towards the yacht. Gaetano was not mistaken. At the stern, the mysterious stranger was standing up, looking towards the shore, and holding a spyglass in his hand. He was attired as he had been on the previous evening, and waved his pocket handkerchief to his guest in token of adieu. Franz returned the salute by shaking his handkerchief as an exchange of signals. After a second, a slight cloud of smoke was seen at the stern of the vessel, which rose gracefully as it expanded in the air, and then Franz heard a slight report. "'There, do you hear?' observed Gaetano. "'He is bidding you adieu.' The young man took his carbine and fired it in the air, but without any idea that the noise could be heard at the distance which separated the yacht from the shore. "'What are your excellency's orders?' inquired Gaetano. "'In the first place, light me a torch.' "'Ah, yes, I understand,' replied the patron. "'To find the entrance to the enchanted apartment. "'With much pleasure, your excellency.' If it would amuse you, I will get you the torch you ask for. But I too have had the idea you have, and two or three times the same fancy has come over me. But I have always given it up. Giovanni, light the torch, he added, and give it to his excellency. Giovanni obeyed. Franz took the lamp and entered the subterranean grotto, followed by Gatano. He recognized the place where he had awakened by the bed of heather that was there, but it was in vain that he carried his torch all around the exterior surface of the grotto. He saw nothing, unless that by traces of smoke others had before him attempted the same thing, and like him, in vain. Yet he did not leave a foot of this granite wall as impenetrable as futurity without strict scrutiny. He did not see a fissure without introducing the blade of his hunting sword into it, or a projecting point on which he did not lean and press in the hopes it would give way. All was vain, and he lost two hours in his attempts, which were at last utterly useless. At the end of this time he gave up his search, and Gaetano smiled. When France appeared again on the shore, the yacht only seemed like a small white speck on the horizon. He looked again through his glass, but even then he could not distinguish anything. Gaetano reminded him that he had come for the purpose of shooting goats, which he had utterly forgotten. He took his fowling piece and began to hunt over the island with the air of a man who is fulfilling a duty rather than enjoying a pleasure, and at the end of a quarter of an hour he had killed a goat and two kids. These animals, though wild and agile as chamois, were too much like domestic goats, and France could not consider them as game. Moreover, other ideas, much more enthralling, occupied his mind. Since the evening before, he had really been the hero of one of the tales of the Thousand and One Nights, and he was irresistibly attracted toward the grotto. Then, in spite of the failure of his first search, he began a second, after having told Gaetano to roast one of the two kids. The second visit was a long one, and when he returned... The kid was roasted and the repast ready. Franz was sitting on the spot where he was on the previous evening when his mysterious host had invited him to supper, and he saw the little yacht, now like a seagull on the wave, 
continuing her flight toward Corsica. Why? he remarked to Gaetano. You told me that Signor Sinbad was going to Malaga. Well, it seems he is in the direction of Porto Vecchio. Don't you remember, said the patron, I told you that among the crew there were two Corsican brigands. True, and he is going to London, added Franz. Precisely so, replied Gaetano. Uh, he is one who fears neither God nor Satan, they say, and would at any time run fifty leagues out of his course to do a poor devil a service. But such service uh, as these might involve him with the authorities of the country in which he practices this kind of philanthropy, said Franz. And what cares he for that, replied Gaetano with a laugh. Or oh, any authorities. He smiles at them. Let them try to pursue him. Why, in the first place, his yacht is not a ship, but a bird, and he would beat any frigate three knots in every nine, and if he were to throw himself on the coast, why is he not certain of finding friends everywhere? It was perfectly clear that the Signor Sinbad, Francis' host, had the honour of being in excellent terms with the smugglers and bandits along the whole coast of the Mediterranean, and so enjoyed exceptional privileges. As to France, he had no longer any inducement to remain at Monte Cristo. He had lost all hope of detecting the secret of the grotto. He consequently dispatched his breakfast, and, his boat being ready, he hastened on board, and they were soon under way. At the moment the boat began her course, they lost sight of the yacht, as it disappeared in the gulf of Porto Vecchio. With it was effaced to the last trace of the preceding night, and then supper, Sinbad, hashish, statues, all became a dream for France. The boat sailed on all day and all night, and next morning, when the sun rose, they had lost sight of Monte Cristo. When France had once again set foot on shore, he forgot, for the moment at least, the events which had just passed, while he finished his affairs of pleasure at Florence, and then thought of nothing but how he should rejoin his companion, who was awaiting him at Rome. He set out, and on the Saturday evening reached the Eternal City by the mail coach. An apartment, as we have said, had been retained beforehand, and thus he had but to go to Signor Pastorini's hotel. But this was not so easy a matter, for the streets were thronged with people, and Rome was already a prey to that low and feverish murmur which precedes all great events. And at Rome there are four great events in every year, the Carnival, Holy Week, Corpus Christi, and the Feast of St. Peter. All the rest of the year the city is in that state of dull apathy between life and death which renders it similar to a kind of station between this world and the next, a sublime spot, a resting place full of poetry and character, and at which France had already halted five or six times, and at each time found it more marvellous and striking. At last he made his way through the mob, which was continually increasing and getting more and more turbulent, and reached a hotel. On his first inquiry he was told, with the impertinence peculiar to hired hackney coachmen and innkeepers with their houses full, that there was no room for him at the Hotel de Londres. Then he sent his card to Signor Pispastrini and asked for Albert de Morcef. This plan succeeded, and Signor Pastrini himself ran to him, excusing himself for having made His Excellency wait, scolding the waiters, taking the candlestick from the porter, who was ready to pounce on the traveller and was about to lead him to Albert, when Morcerf himself appeared. The apartment consisted of two small rooms and a parlour. The two rooms looked on to the street, a fact which Signor Pastrini commented upon as an inappreciable advantage. The rest of the floor was hired by a very rich gentleman who was supposed to be a Sicilian or Maltese, but the host was unable to decide to which of the two nations the traveller belonged. "'Very good, Signor Pastrini,' said Franz. "'But we must have some supper instantly, and a carriage for tomorrow, and the following days.' "'As to supper,' replied the landlord, "'you shall be served immediately.' But as for the carriage... What as to the carriage? exclaimed Albert. Come, come, Signor Pastrini. No joking. 
we must have a carriage. Sir, replied the host, we will do all in our power to procure you one. This is all I can say. And when shall we know? inquired Franz. Tomorrow morning, answered the innkeeper. Oh, the deuce! Then we shall pay the more, that's all. I see plainly enough. At Drake's or Aaron's one pays twenty-five lira for common days, and thirty or thirty-five lira a day more for Sundays and feast days, and five lira a day more for extras. That will make forty, and there's an end of it. I am afraid if we offer them double, that we shall not procure a carriage. Then they must put horses to mine. It is a little worse for the journey, but that's no matter. There are no horses. Albert looked at Franz like a man who hears a reply he does not understand. Do you understand that, my dear Franz? No horses, he said. But can't we have post horses? They have been all hired this fortnight, and there are none left but those absolutely requisite for posting. What are we to say to this? asked Franz. I say that when a thing completely surpasses my comprehension, I am accustomed not to dwell on that thing, but to pass to another. Is supper ready, Signor Pastrini? Yes, Your Excellency. Well then, let us sup. But the carriage and the horses, said Franz. Be easy, my dear boy. They will come in due season. It is only a question of how much shall be charged for them, Morsef. Then, with that delighted philosophy which believes that nothing is impossible to a full purse or well-lined pocketbook, supped, went to bed, slept soundly, and dreamed he was racing all over Rome at carnival time in a coach with six horses. End of chapter 32「Of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 33 Roman Bandits. The next morning, Franz woke first and instantly rang the bell. The sound had not yet died away when Signor Pastrini himself entered. Well, Excellency, said the landlord triumphantly, and without waiting for Franz to question him, I feared yesterday, when I would not promise you anything. "'But you are too late. There is not a single carriage to be had. "'That is, for the last three days of the carnival.' "'Yes,' returned Franz. "'For the very three days it is most needed.' "'What is the matter?' said Albert, entering. "'No carriage to be had?' "'Just so,' returned Franz. "'You have guessed it.' "'Well, your eternal city is a nice sort of place.' "'That is to say, Excellency,' replied Pastrini, who was desirous of keeping up the dignity of the capital of the Christian world in the eyes of his guest, that there are no carriages to be had from Sunday to Tuesday evening. But from now till Sunday, you can have fifty, if you please. Ah, uh, that is something, said Albert. Today is Thursday, and who knows what may arrive between this and Sunday. Ten or twelve thousand travellers will arrive, replied Franz which will make it still more difficult. My friend, said Morsef, let us enjoy the present without gloomy forebodings for the future. At least we can have a window. Where? In the corso. Ah, a window, exclaimed Signor Pastrini. Utterly impossible. There was only one left on the fifth floor of the Doria Palace, and that has been let to a Russian prince for twenty sequins a day. The two young men looked at each other with an air of stupefaction. "'Well,' said Franz to Albert, "'do you know what is the best thing we can do? "'It is to pass the carnival at Venice. "'There we are sure of obtaining gondolas, "'if we cannot have carriages.' "'Oh, the devil, no!' cried Albert. I "'Came to Rome to see the carnival. "'And I will, though I see it on stilts.' "'Bravo! An excellent idea!' We will disguise ourselves as a monster pulcinellos or shepherds of the land, and we shall have complete success. Do your excellencies still wish for a carriage from now to Sunday morning? Parbleu, said Albert. 
Do you think we are going to run about on foot in the streets of Rome, like lawyer's clerks? I hasten to comply with your Excellency's wishes. Only I tell you beforehand, the carriage will cost you six piastres a day. And as I am not a millionaire, like the gentleman in the next apartment, said Franz, I warn you that as I have been four times before at Rome, I know the prices of all the carriages. We will give you twelve piastres for today, tomorrow, and the day after, and then you will make a good profit. But, Excellency, said Pastrini, still striving to gain his point. Now go, returned Franz, or I shall go myself and bargain with your affetitore, who is mine also. He is an old friend of mine, who has plundered me pretty well already, and in the hope of making more out of me, he will take a less price than the one I offer you. You will lose the preference, and that will be your fault. Do not give yourselves the trouble, Excellency, returned Signor Pastrini with the smile peculiar to the Italian speculator when he confesses his defeat. I will do all I can, and I hope you will be satisfied. And now we understand each other. When do you wish the carriage to be here? In an hour. In an hour it will be at the door. An hour after the vehicle was at the door, it was a hack conveyance which was elevated to the rank of a private carriage in honour of the occasion, but in spite of its humble exterior, the young men would have thought themselves happy to have secured it for the last three days of the carnival. Excellency, cried the Cicerone, seeing Franz approach the window, shall I bring the carriage near to the palace? Accustomed as Franz was to the Italian phraseology, his first impulse was to look around him, but these words were addressed to him. France was the Excellency, and the vehicle was the carriage, and the Hotel de Londres was the palace. The genius for laudation characteristic of the race was in that phrase. France and Albert descended, the carriage approached the palace. Their Excellencies stretched their legs along the seats. The Cicerone sprang into the seat behind. Where do your Excellencies wish to go? asked he. To St. Peter's first, and then to the Colosseum, returned Albert. But Albert did not know that it takes a day to see St. Peter's, and a month to study it. The day was passed at St. Peter's alone. Suddenly the daylight began to fade away. Franz took out his watch. It was half past four. They returned to the hotel. At the door, Franz ordered the coachman to be ready to eat. He wished to show Albert the Colosseum by moonlight, as he had shown him St. Peter's by daylight. When we show a friend a city, one has already visited. We feel the same pride as when we point out a woman whose lover we have been. He was to leave the city by the Porta del Popolo, skirt the outer wall, and re-enter by the Porta San Giovanni. Thus they would behold the Colosseum, without finding their impressions dulled by first looking on the Capitol, the Forum, the Arch of Septimus Severus, the Temple of Antoninus and Fastina, and the Via Sacra. They sat down to dinner, Signor Pastrini had promised them a banquet. He gave them a tolerable repast. At the end of the dinner he entered in person. Franz thought that he came to hear his dinner praised, and began accordingly. But at the first words he was interrupted. Excellency, said Pastrini, I am delighted to have your approbation, but it was not for that I came. Did you come to tell us you have procured a carriage? asked Albert, lighting his cigar. No. And your excellencies will do well not to think of that any longer. At Rome things can or cannot be done. When you are told anything cannot be done, there is an end of it. It is much more convenient at Paris. When anything cannot be done, you pay double, and it is done directly. That is what all the French say, returned Signor Pastrini, somewhat piqued. For that reason, I do not understand why they travel. But, said Albert, emitting a volume of smoke and balancing his chair on its hind legs, only madmen or blockheads like us ever do travel. Men in their senses do not quit their hotel in the Rue du Helder, their walk on the Boulevard de Gand and the Café de Paris. It is, of course, understood that Albert resided in the aforesaid street, appeared every day on the fashionable walk, and dined frequently at the only restaurant where you can really dine. That is if you are on good terms with its frequenters. Signor Pastorini remained silent a short time. 
It was evident that he was amusing over this answer, which did not seem very clear. But, said Franz, in his turn interrupting his host's meditation, you had some motive for coming here. May I beg to know what it was? Uh, yes, sir. You have ordered your carriage at eight o'clock precisely. I have. You intend visiting Il Colosseo? You mean the Colosseum? It is the same thing. You have told your coachman to leave the city by the Porta del Popolo, to drive around the walls and re-enter by the Porta San Giovanni. These are my words exactly. Well, this route is impossible. Impossible? Very dangerous, to say the least. Dangerous? Why? On account of the famous Luigi Vampa. Pray, who may this famous Luigi Vampa be? inquired Albert. He may be very famous at Rome, but I can assure you he is quite unknown at Paris. What? Do you not know him? I have not that honour. You have never heard his name? Never. Well, then, he is a bandit compared to whom the De Chassaris and the Gasparones were mere children. Now then, Albert, cried Franz, here is a bandit for you at last. I forewarn you, Signor Pastrini, that I shall not believe one word of what you are going to tell us. Having told you this, begin. Once upon a time. Well, go on. Signor Pastrini turned toward Franz, who seemed to him the more reasonable of the two. We must do him justice. He had had a great many Frenchmen in his house, but had never been able to comprehend them. Excellency, said he gravely, addressing Franz, if you look upon me as a liar, it is useless for me to say anything. It was for your interest. Albert does not say you are a liar, Signor Pastrini, said Franz, but that he will not believe what you are going to tell us. But I will believe all you say, so proceed. But if your excellency doubt my veracity, Signor Pastrini, returned Franz, you are more susceptible than Cassandra, who was a prophetess and yet no one believed her, while you at least are sure of the credence of half your audience. Come, sit down and tell us all about this Signor Vamba. I had told your excellency, he is the most famous bandit we have had since the days of Mastrilla. Well, what has this bandit to do with the order I have given, the coachman to leave the city by the Porta del Popolo and to re-enter by the Porta San Giovanni? This, replied Signor Pastrini, that you will go out by one but I very much doubt you're returning by the other. Why? asked Franz. Because after nightfall, you are not safe fifty yards from the gates. On your honour, is that true? cried Albert. Count, returned Signor Pastrini, hurt at Albert's repeated doubts of the truth of his assertions. I do not say this to you, but to your companion, who knows Rome and knows too, that these things are not to be laughed at. My dear fellow, said Albert, turning to France, here is an admirable adventure. We will fill our carriage with pistols, blunderbusses, and double-barreled guns. Luigi Vampa comes to take us, and we take him. We bring him back to Rome and present him to His Holiness the Pope, who asks how he can repay so great a service. Then we merely ask for a carriage and a pair of horses, and we see the carnival in the carriage, and doubtless the Roman people will crown us at the capital and proclaim us like Cotius and the veiled Horatius, the preservers of their country. Whilst Albert proposed the scheme, Signor Pastrini's face assumed an expression impossible to describe. And pray, asked Franz, where are these pistols, blunderbusses, and other deadly weapons with which you intend filling the carriage? Not out of my armory, for at Terracina I was plundered, even of my hunting knife. I shared the same fate at Aquapendente. Do you know, Signor Pastrini, said Albert, lighting a second cigar at the first, that this practice is very convenient for bandits, and that it seems to be due to an arrangement of their own? 
Doubtless Signor Pasolini found this pleasantry compromising, for he only answered half the question, and then he spoke to France, as the only one likely to listen with attention. Your Excellency knows that it is not customary to defend yourself when attacked by bandits. What? cried Albert, whose courage revolted at the idea of being plundered tamely. Not make any resistance? No, for it would be useless. What could you do against a thousand bandits who spring out of some pit, ruin or aqueduct, and level their pieces at you? Et parbleu, they should kill me. The innkeeper turned to France with an air that seemed to say, Your friend is decidedly mad. My dear Albert, returned France, Your answer is sublime and worthy the let him die of Corneille. Only, when Horace made that answer, the safety of Rome was concerned, but as for us it is only to gratify a whim, and it would be ridiculous to risk our lives for so foolish a motive. Albert poured himself out a glass of lacrima Christi, which he sipped at intervals, muttering some unintelligible words. Well, Signor Pastrini, said Franz, now that my companion is quieted, and you have seen how peaceful my intentions are, tell me, who is this Luigi Vampa? Is he a shepherd or a nobleman? Young or old? Tall or short? Describe him, in order that if we meet him by chance, like a bugaboo John or Lara, we may recognize him. You could not apply to any one better able to inform you on all these points, for I knew him when he was a child, and one day that I fell into his hands, going from Ferentino to Altri, he, fortunately for me, recollected me and set me free, not only without a ransom, but made me a present of a very splendid watch, and related his history to me. Let us see the watch, said Albert. Signor Pastrini drew from his fob a magnificent bruguet, bearing the name of its maker, of Parisian manufacture, and a count's coronet. Here it is, said he. Best, returned Albert. I compliment you on it. I have its fellow. He took his watch from his waistcoat pocket. And it cost me three thousand francs. Let us hear the history, said Franz, motioning Signor Pastrini to seat himself. Your Excellencies permit it? asked the host. Bon Dieu, cried Albert. You are not a preacher to remain standing. The host sat down after having made each of them a respectful bow, which meant that he was ready to tell them all they wished to know concerning Luigi Vampa. You tell me, said Franz, at the moment Signor Pastrini was about to open his mouth, that you knew Luigi Vampa when he was a child. He is still a young man, then. A young man? He is only two and twenty. He will gain himself a reputation. What do you think of that, Albert? At two and twenty, to be thus famous? Yes, and at his age, Alexander, Caesar, and Napoleon, who have all made some noise in the world, were quite behind him. So, continued Franz, the hero of this history is only two and twenty. Scarcely so much. Is he tall or short? Of the middle height, about the same stature as his excellency, returned the host, pointing to Albert. Thanks for the comparison, said Albert with a bow. Go on, Signor Castellini, continued Franz, smiling at his friend's susceptibility. To what class of society does he belong? He was a shepherd boy, attached to the farm of the Count of San Felice, situated between Palestrina and the Lake of Gabri. He was born at Pampinara and entered the Count's service when he was five years old. His father was also a shepherd who owned a small flock, and lived by the wool and milk which he sold at Rome. When quite a child, the little Vampa displayed a most extraordinary precocity. One day, when he was seven years old, he came to the curate of Palestrina and asked to be taught to read. It was somewhat difficult, for he could not quit his flock, but the good curate went every day to St. Mass at the little hamlet, too poor to pay a priest, and which having no other name, was called Borgo. He told Luigi that he might meet him on his return, and that then he would give him a lesson, warning him that it would be short, and that he must profit as much as possible by it. The child accepted joyfully. Every day, Luigi led his flock to graze on the road that leads from Palestrina to Borgo, 
every day at nine o'clock in the morning, the priest and the boy sat down on a bank by the wayside, and the little shepherd took his lesson out of the priest's breviary. At the end of three months, he had learned to read. This was not enough. He must now learn to write. The priest had a writing teacher at Rome make three alphabets, one large, one middling, and one small, and pointed out to him that by the help of a sharper instrument he could trace the letters on a slate, and thus learned to write. The same evening, when the flock was safe at the farm, the little Luigi hastened to the smith at Palestrina, took a large nail, heated and sharpened it, and formed a sort of stylus. The next morning he gathered an armful of pieces of slate, and began. At the end of three months he had learned to write. The curate, astonished at his quickness and intelligence, made him a present of pens, paper, and a penknife. This demanded new effort, but nothing compared to the first. At the end of a week he wrote as well with his pen as with the stylus. The curate related the incident to the Count of San Felice, who sent for the little shepherd, made him read and write before him, ordered his attendants to let him eat with the domestics and to give him two piastres a month. With this, Luigi purchased books and pencils. He applied his imitative powers to everything, and like Giotto, when young he drew on his slate sheep, houses and trees. Then with his knife he began to carve all sorts of objects in the wood. It was thus that Pinelli, the famous sculptor, had commenced. A girl of six or seven, that is a little younger than Vampa, tended sheep on a farm near Palestrina. She was an orphan, born at Valmontone, and was named Teresa. The two children met, sat down near each other, let their flocks mingle together, played, laughed, and conversed together in the evening they separated the Count of San Felice's flock from those of Baron Gervetri, and the children returned to their respective farms, promising to meet the next morning. The next day they kept their word, and thus they grew up together. Vampa was twelve, and Teresa eleven. And yet their natural disposition revealed itself. Beside his taste for the fine arts, which Luigi had carried as far as he could in his solitude. He was given to alternating fits of sadness and enthusiasm, was often angry and capricious, and always sarcastic. None of the lads of Pampinara, Palestrina, or Valmontone had been able to gain any influence over him, or even to become his companion. His disposition, always inclined to exact concessions rather than to make them, kept him aloof from all friendships. Teresa alone, ruled by a look, a word, a gesture, this impetuous character, which yielded beneath the hand of a woman, and which beneath the hand of a man might have broken, but could never have been bended. Teresa was lively and gay, but coquettish to excess. The two piastres that Luigi received every month from the Count of San Felice's steward and the price of all the little carvings in wood he sold at Rome were expended in earrings, necklaces, and gold hairpins, so that, thanks to her friend's generosity, Teresa was the most beautiful and the best attired peasant near Rome. The two children grew up together, passing all their time with each other and giving themselves up to the wild ideas of their different characters. Thus, in all their dreams, their wishes, and their conversations, Vampa saw himself the captain of a vessel, general of an army, or governor of a province. Teresa saw herself rich, superbly attired, and attended by a train of livery domestics. Then, when they had thus passed the day in building castles in the air, they separated their flocks, and descended from the elevation of their dreams to the reality of their humble position. One day, the younger shepherd told the Count's steward that he had seen a wolf come out of the Sabine mountains and prowl around his flock. The steward gave him a gun. This was what Vampa longed for. This gun had an excellent barrel 
made at Brescia and carrying a ball with the precision of an English rifle. But one day, the Count broke the stock and had then cast the gun aside. This, however, was nothing to a sculptor like a vamp. He examined the broken stock, calculated what change it would require to adapt the gun to his shoulder, and made a fresh stock, so beautifully carved that it would have fetched fifteen or twenty piastres had he chosen to sell it. But nothing could be farther from his thoughts. For a long time, a gun had been the young man's greatest ambition. In every country where independence has taken the place of liberty, the first desire of a manly heart is to possess a weapon which at once renders him capable of defence or attack, and by rendering its own terrible often makes him feared. From this moment, Vampa devoted all his leisure time to perfecting himself in the use of his precious weapon. He purchased powder and ball, and everything served him for a mark. The trunk of some old and moss-grown olive tree that grew on the Sabine mountains. The fox, as he quitted his earth on some marauding excursion. The eagle that soared above their heads. And thus he soon became an expert. And Teresa overcame the terror she had first felt at the report and amused herself by watching him direct the ball wherever he pleased, with as much accuracy as if he placed it by hand. One evening, a wolf emerged from a pine wood here which they were usually stationed. But the wolf had scarcely advanced ten yards ere he was dead. Proud of this exploit, Vampa took the dead animal on his shoulders and carried him to the farm. These exploits had gained Luigi considerable reputation, the man of superior abilities always finds admirers, go where he will. He was spoken of as the most adroit, the strongest, and the most courageous contadino. He felt as though he should soon. Every pulse beat with violence, and it seemed as though a bell were ringing in his ears. When they spoke, although Teresa listened timidly and with downcast eyes to the conversation of her cavalier, as Luigi could read in the ardent looks of the good-looking young man, that his language was that of praise. It seemed as if the whole world was turning round with him, and all the voices of hell were whispering in his ears ideas of murder and assassination. Then, fearing that his paroxysm might get the better of him, he clutched with one hand the branch of a tree against which he was leaning, and with the other convulsively grasped the dagger with a carved handle which was in his belt, and which unwittingly he drew from the scabbard from time to time. Luigi was jealous. He felt that, influenced by her ambitions and coquettish disposition, Teresa might escape him. The young peasant girl, at first timid and scared, soon recovered herself. We have said that Teresa was handsome, but this is not all. Teresa was endowed with all those wild graces, which are so much more potent than our affected and studied elegancies. She had almost all the honours of the quadrille, and if she were envious of the Count of San Felice's daughter, we will not undertake to say that Carmela was not jealous of her. And with overpowering compliments, her handsome cavalier led her back to the place whence he had taken her, and where Luigi waited her. Twice or thrice, during the dance, the young girl had glanced at Luigi, and each time she saw that he was pale, and that his features were agitated. Once even the blade of his knife, half drawn from its sheath, had dazzled her eyes with its sinister glare. Thus it was almost tremblingly that she resumed her lover's arm. The quadrille had been most perfect, and it was evident there was a great demand for a repetition, Carmela alone objecting to it. But the Count of San Felice besought his daughter so earnestly that she acceded. One of the cavaliers then hastened to invite Teresa, without whom it was impossible for the quadrille to be formed. But the young girl had disappeared. The truth was that Luigi had not felt the strength to support another such trial, and half by persuasion and half by force he had removed Teresa toward another part of the garden. Teresa had yielded in spite of herself, 
but when she looked at the agitated countenance of the young man, she understood by his silence and trembling voice that something strange was passing within him. She herself was not exempt from internal emotion and without having done anything wrong, yet fully comprehended that Luigi was right in reproaching her. Why, she did not know, but yet she did not feel less that these reproaches were merited. However, to Teresa's great astonishment, Luigi remained mute, and not a word escaped his lips the rest of the evening. When the chill of the night had driven away the guests from the gardens, and the gates of the villa were closed on them for the festa indoors, he took Teresa quite away, and as he left her at her home he said, Teresa, what were you thinking of as you danced opposite to the young countess of San Felice? I thought, replied the young girl, with all the frankness of her nature, that I would give half of my life for a costume such as she wore. And what said your cavalier to you? He said it only depended on myself to have it, and I had only one word to say. He was right, said Luigi. Do you desire it as ardently as you say? Yes. Well, then, you shall have it. The young girl, much astonished, raised her head to look at him, but his face was so gloomy and terrible that her words froze to her lips. As Luigi spoke thus, he left her. Teresa followed him with her eyes into the darkness as long as she could. And when he had quite disappeared, she went into the house with a sigh. That night, a memorable event occurred due no doubt to the imprudence of some servant who had neglected to extinguish the lights. The villa of San Felice took fire in the rooms adjoining the very apartment of the lovely Carmela. Awakened in the night by the light of the flames, she sprang out of the bed, wrapped herself in a dressing gown, and attempted to escape by the door. But the corridor by which she hoped to fly was already a prey to the flames. She then returned to her room, calling for help as loudly as she could, when suddenly her window, which was twenty feet from the ground, was opened. A young peasant jumped into the chamber, seized her in his arms, and with superhuman skill and strength conveyed her to the turf of the grass plot where she fainted. When she recovered, her father was by her side. All the servants surrounded her, offering her assistance. An entire wing of the villa was burnt down, but what of that, as long as Carmela was safe and uninjured? Her preserver was everywhere sought for, but he did not appear. He was inquired as her, but no one had seen him. Carmela was greatly troubled, but she had not recognized him, as the Count was immensely rich, excepting the danger Carmela had run, and the marvellous manner in which she had escaped made that appear to him rather a favour of providence than a real misfortune. The loss occasioned by the conflagration was to him but a trifle. The next day, at the usual hour, the two young peasants were on the borders of the forest. Luigi arrived first. He came to work Teresa in high spirits and seemed to have completely forgotten the events of the previous evening. The young girl was very pensive, but seeing Luigi so cheerful, she on her part assuming a smiling air which was natural to her when she was not excited or in her passion. Luigi took her arm beneath his own, and led us to the door of the grotto. Then he paused. The young girl, perceiving that there was something extraordinary, looked at him steadfastly. Teresa, said Luigi, yesterday evening you told me you would give all the world to have a costume similar to that of the Count's daughter. Yes, replied Teresa with astonishment, but I was mad to utter such a wish. And I replied, Very well, you shall have it. Yes, replied the young girl, whose astonishment increased at every word uttered by Luigi. But of course your reply was only to please me. I have promised no more than I have given you, Teresa, said Luigi proudly. Go into the grotto and dress yourself. At these words, he drew away the stone and showed Teresa the grotto. 
lighted up by two wax lights, which burned on each side of a splendid mirror on a rustic table made by Luigi, was spread out the pearl necklace and the diamond pins, and on a chair at the side was laid the rest of the costume. Teresa uttered a cry of joy, and without inquiring whence this attire came, or even thanking Luigi, darted into the grotto transformed into a dressing room. Luigi pushed a stone behind her, for on the crest of a small adjacent hill, which cut off the view toward Palestrina, he saw a traveller on horseback, stopping a moment, as if uncertain of his road, and thus presenting against the blue sky that perfect outline which is peculiar to distant objects in certain climes. When he saw Luigi, he put his horse into a gallop and advanced toward him. Luigi was not mistaken. The traveller, who was going from Palestrina to Tivoli, had a mistake on his way. The young man directed him, but as at a distance of a quarter of a mile the road again divided into three ways, and on reaching the east the traveller might again stray from his route, he begged Luigi to be his guide. Luigi threw his cloak on the ground, placed his carbine on his shoulder, and freed from his heavy covering, preceded the traveller with the rapid step of a mountaineer, which a horse can scarcely keep up with. In ten minutes, Luigi and the traveller reached the crossroads. On arriving there with an air as majestic as that of an emperor, he stretched his hand towards that of one of the roads, which the traveller was to follow. That is your road, Excellency, and now you cannot again mistake. And here is your recompense, said the traveller, offering the young herdsman some small pieces of money. Thank you, said Luigi, drawing back his hand. I render a service. I do not sell it. Well, uh, replied the traveller, who seemed used to this difference between the servility of a man of the cities and the pride of the mountaineer. If you refuse the wages, you will perhaps accept a gift. Ah, yes, that is another thing. Then, uh, said the traveller, take these two Venetian sequins and give them to your bride to make herself a pair of earrings. And then do you take this poniard, said the young herdsman. You will not find one better carved between Albano and Civita Castellana. I accept it, answered the traveller, but then the obligation will be on my side, for this poniard is worth more than two sequins. For a dealer, perhaps, but for me, who engraved it myself, it is hardly worth a piastre. What is your name? inquired the traveller. Luigi Vampa, replied the shepherd, with the same air as he would have replied, Alexander, King of Macedon. And yours? I, said the traveller, am called Sinbad the Sailor. Franz Epinay started with surprise. Sinbad the Sailor? he said. Yes, replied the narrator. That was the name which the traveller gave to Vampa as his own. Well, and what may you have to say against this name? inquired Albert. It is a very pretty name, and the adventures of the gentleman of that name amused me very much in my youth, I must confess. Franz said no more. The name of Sinbad the Sailor, as may well be supposed, awakened in him a world of recollections, as had the name of the Count of Monte Cristo on the previous evening. Proceed, said he to the host. A vamp up put the two sequins haughtily into his pocket, and slowly returned by the way he had gone. As he came within two or three hundred paces of the grotto, he thought he heard a cry. He listened to know whence this sound could proceed. A moment afterwards, he thought he heard his own name pronounced distinctly. The cry proceeded from the grotto. He bounded like a chamois cocking his carbine as he went, and in a moment reached the summit of a hill opposite to that on which he had perceived the traveller. Three cries for help came more distinctly to his ear. He cast his eyes around him, and saw a man carrying off Teresa, as Nessus the centaur carried De Janeira. This man, who was hastening toward the wood, was already three-quarters of the way on the road from the grotto to the forest. Vampa measured the distance. The man was at least two hundred paces in advance of him, and there was not a chance of overtaking him. The young shepherd stopped, 
as if his feet had been rooted to the ground. Then he put the butt of his carbine to his shoulder, took aim at the ravisher, followed him for a second in his track and then fired. The ravisher stopped, suddenly. His knees bent under him and he fell with Teresa in his arms. The young girl rose instantly, but the man lay on earth, struggling in the agonies of death. Vampa then rushed towards Teresa, for at ten paces from the dying man her legs had failed her, and she had dropped on her knees, so that the young man feared that the ball that had brought down his enemy had also wounded his betrothed. Fortunately she was unscathed, and it was fright alone that had overcome Teresa. When Luigi had assured himself that she was safe and unharmed, he turned towards the wounded man. He had just expired, with clinched hands, his mouth in a spasm of agony, and his hair on end in the sweat of death. His eyes remained open and menacing. Vampa approached the corpse and recognized Cuchumetto, on which the bandit had been saved by the two young peasants. He had been enamored of Teresa, and had sworn she should be his. From that time he had watched them, and profiting by the moment when her love had left her alone, had carried her off, and believed he at length had her in his power, when the ball, directed by the unerring skill of the young herdsman, had pierced his heart. Vampa gazed on him for a moment without betraying the slightest emotion, while on the contrary, Teresa, shuddering in every limb, dared not approach the slain ruffian, but by degrees, and threw a hesitating glance at the dead body over the shoulder of her lover. Suddenly, Vampa turned towards his mistress. Ah, said he, good, good, you are dressed. It is now my turn to dress myself. Teresa was clothed from head to foot in the garb of the Count of San Felice's daughter. Vampa took Cuchumetto's body in his arms and conveyed it to the grotto, while in her turn... Teresa remained outside. If a second traveller had passed, he would have seen a strange thing, a shepherdess watching her flock, clad in a cashmere gown, with earrings and necklace of pearls, diamond pins and buttons of sapphires, emeralds and rubies. He would no doubt have believed that he had returned to the times of Florian, and would have declared on reaching Paris that he had met an alpine shepherdess seated at the foot of the Sabine Hill. At the end of a quarter of an hour, Vampa quitted the grotto. His costume was no less elegant than that of Teresa. He wore a vest of garnet-coloured velvet, with buttons of cut gold, a silk waistcoat covered with embroidery, a Roman scarf tied around his neck, a cartridge box worked with gold and red and green silk, sky-blue velvet breeches fastened above the knee with diamond buckles, garters of deerskin, worked with a thousand arabesques, and a hat where hung ribbons of all colours. Two watches hung from his girdle, and a splendid poniard was on his belt. Teresa uttered a cry of admiration. Vampa, in this attire, resembled a painting by Leopold Robert or Schmetz. He had assumed the entire costume of Cuchumetto. The young man, saw the effect produced on his betrothed, and a smile of pride passed over his lips. Now, he said to Teresa, are you ready to share my fortune, whatever it may be? Oh, yes, exclaimed the young girl, enthusiastically. And follow me wherever I go. To the world's end. Then take my arm, and let us on. We have no time to lose. The young girl did so without questioning her love, as to where he was conducting her, for he appeared to her at this moment as handsome, proud, and powerful as a god. They went towards the forest, and soon entered it. We need scarcely say that all the paths of the mountain were known to Vampa. He therefore went forward without a moment's hesitation, although there was no beaten track. But he knew his paths by looking at the trees and bushes, and thus they kept on advancing for nearly an hour and a half. At the end of this time, they had reached the thickest of the forest. A torrent, whose bed was dry, led into a deep gorge. Vampa took this wild road, which, enclosed between two ridges and shadowed by the tufted umbrage of the pines, 
seemed but for the difficulties of its descent, that path to Avernus of which Virgil speaks. Teresa had become alarmed at the wild and deserted look of the plain around her, and pressed closely against her guide, not uttering a syllable. But as she saw him advance, with even step and composed countenance, she endeavoured to repress her emotion. Suddenly, about ten paces from them, a man advancing from behind a tree and aimed at Vampa. Not another step, he said, or you are a dead man. What then? said Vampa, raising his hand with a gesture of disdain, while Teresa, no longer able to restrain her alarm, clung closely to him. Do wolves rend each other? Who are you? inquired the sentinel. I am Luigi Vampa, shepherd of the San Felice farm. What do you want? I would speak with your companions, who are in the glade at Rocca Bianca. Follow me, then, said the sentinel, or, as you know your way, go first. Vampa smiled disdainfully at this precaution on the part of the bandit, went before Teresa and continued to advance with the same firm and easy step as before. At the end of ten minutes, the bandit made them a sign to stop. The two young persons obeyed. Then the bandit thrice imitated the cry of a crow. A croak answered the signal. Good, said the sentry. You may now go on. Luigi and Teresa again set forward. As they went on, Teresa clung tremblingly at her lover at the sight of weapons and the glistening of carbines through the trees. The retreat of Rocca Bianca was at the top of a small mountain, which no doubt in former days had been a volcano, an extinct volcano before the days when Remus and Romulus had deserted Alba to come and found the city of Rome. Teresa and Luigi reached the summit, and all at once found themselves in the presence of twenty bandits. "'Here is a young man who seeks and wishes to speak to you,' said the sentinel. "'What has he to say?' inquired the young man who was in command in the chief's absence. "'I wish to say that I am tired of a shepherd's life,' was Vampa's reply. "'Ah, I understand,' said the lieutenant. "'And you seek admittance into our ranks.' "'Welcome!' cried several bandits from Ferrocino, Pampinara, and Anandi, who had recognized Luigi Vampa. "'Yes, but I came to ask something more than to be your companion.' "'And what may that be?' inquired the bandits with astonishment. "'I come to ask to be your captain,' said the young man. The bandits shouted with laughter. "'And what have you done to aspire to this honor?" demanded the lieutenant. I have killed your chief, Cucciumetto, whose dress I now wear, and I set fire to the Villa San Felice to procure a wedding dress for my betrothed. An hour afterwards Luigi Vampa was chosen captain. Vice Cucciumetto deceased. Well, my dear Albert, said Franz, turning towards his friend, what think you of citizen Luigi Vampa? I say he is a myth, replied Albert, and never had an existence. And what may a myth be? inquired Pastrini. The explanation would be too long, my dear landlord, replied Franz. And what say you, Signor Vampire, exercises his profession at this moment in the environs of Rome, and with a boldness of which no bandit before him ever gave an example? Then the police have vainly tried to lay hands on him? Why, you see, he has a good understanding with the shepherds in the plains, the fishermen of the Tiber, and the smugglers of the coast. They seek for him in the mountains, and he is on the waters. They follow him on the waters, and he is on the open sea. Then they pursue him, and he has suddenly taken refuge in the islands at Giglio, Guanotti, or Monte Cristo. And when they hunt for him there, he reappears suddenly at Albano, Tivoli, or La Riccia. And how does he behave toward travellers? Alas, his plan is very simple. It depends on the distance he may be from the city, whether he gives eight hours, twelve hours, or a day wherein to pay their ransom. And when that time has elapsed, he allows another hour's grace. At the sixtieth minute of this hour, if the money is not forthcoming, he blows out the prisoner's brains with a pistol shot, or plants his dagger in his heart. 
and that settles the account. Well, Albert, inquired Franz of his companion, are you still disposed to go to the Colosseum by the outer wall? Quite so, said Albert. If the way be picturesque. The clock struck nine as the door opened and a coachman appeared. Excellencies, said he, the coach is ready. Well then, said Franz, let us to the Colosseum. By the Porta del Popolo, or by the streets, your excellencies? By the streets, Morbleu, by the streets, cried Franz. Ah, my dear fellow, said Albert, rising and lighting his third cigar. Really, I thought you had more courage. So saying, the two young men went down the staircase and got into the carriage. End of chapter 33"'because it was known that she was beloved by Vampa. "'And yet the two younger people had never declared their affection. "'They had grown together, like two trees whose roots are mingled, "'whose branches intertwine, and whose intermingled perfume rises to the heavens. "'Only their wish to see each other had become a necessity, "'and they would have preferred the death to a day's separation.' Teresa was sixteen and Vampa seventeen. About this time a band of brigands that had established itself in the Lepini Mountains began to be much spoken of. The brigands have never been really extirpated from the neighbourhood of Roma. Sometimes a chief is wanted. But when a chief presents himself, he rarely has to wait long for a band of followers. The celebrated Cuciumeto, pursued in the Abruzzo, driven out of the kingdoms of Naples where he had carried on a regular war, had crossed the Garigliano like Manfred and had taken refuge on the banks of the Amasine between Sonino and Giuperno. He strove to collect a band of followers and followed the footsteps of De Charis and Gasperone whom he hoped to surpass. Many young men of Palestrina, Frascati and Papinara had disappeared. Their disappearance at first caused much disquietude, but it was soon known that they had joined Cuciumeto. After some time, Cuciumeto became the object of a universal attention. The most extraordinary traits of ferocious daring and brutality were related of him. One day he carried off a young girl, the daughter of a surveyor of Frosinone. The bandit's laws are positive. A young girl belongs first to him who carries her off. Then the rest draw lots for her, and she is abandoned to their brutality until death relieves her sufferings. When their parents are sufficiently rich to pay a ransom, a messenger is sent to negotiate. The prisoner is hostage for the security of the messenger. Should the ransom be refused, the prisoner is irrevocably lost. The young girl's lover was in Curtumetto's troop. His name was Carlini. When she recognized her lover, the poor girl extended her arms to him and believed herself safe. But Carlini felt his heart sink, for he but too well knew the fate that awaited her. However, as he was a favourite with Cuciumetto, as he had for three years faithfully served him, and as he had saved his life by shooting a dragoon who was about to cut him down, he hoped the chief would have pity on him. He took Cuciumetto one side, while the young girl seated at the foot of a huge pine that stood in the centre of the forest, made a veil of her picturesque headdress to hide her face from the lascivious gaze of the bandits. There he told the chief all, his affection for the prisoner, the promises of mutual fidelity, and how every night since he had been near they had met in some neighbouring ruins. It so happened that night that Cuciumetto had sent Carlini to a village, so that he had been unable to go to the place of meeting. Cuciumetto had been there, however, by accident, as he said, and had carried the maiden off. Carlini besought his chief to make an exception in Rita's favour, as her father was rich and he could pay a larger ransom. Cuciumetto seemed to yield to his friend's entreaties, and bade him find a shepherd to send to Rita's father at Frosinone. 
Carlini flew joyfully to Rita, telling her she was saved and bidding her ride to her father to inform him what had occurred and that her ransom was fixed at three hundred piastres. Twelve hours' delay was all that was granted, that is, until nine the next morning. The instant the letter was written, Carlini seized it and hastened to the plane to find a messenger. He found a young shepherd watching his flock. The natural messengers of the bandits are the shepherds who live between the city and the mountains, between civilized and savage life. The boy undertook the commission, promising to be in Frosinone in less than an hour. Carlini returned, anxious to see his mistress, and announced the joyful intelligence. He found the troop in the glade, supping off the provisions exacted as contributions from the peasants, but his eye vainly sought Rita and Cucciumetto among them. He inquired where they were, and was answered by a burst of laughter. A cold perspiration burst from every pore, and his hair stood on end. He repeated his question. One of the bandits rose and offered him a glass, filled with Orvieto, saying, To the health of the brave Cucciumetto and the fair Rita. At this moment Carlini heard a woman's cry. He divined the truth, seized the glass, broke it across the face of him who presented it, and rushed towards the spot whence the cry came. After a hundred yards, he turned the corner of the thicket. He found Rita senseless in the arms of Cucciumetto. At the sight of Carlini, Cucciumetto rose, a pistol in each hand. The two brigands looked at each other for a moment, the one with a smile of lasciviousness on his lips, the other with the pallor of death on his brow. A terrible battle between the two men seemed imminent, but by degrees Carlini's features relaxed. His hand, which had grasped one of the pistols in his belt, fell to his side. Rita lay between them. The moon lighted the group. Well, said Cucciumetto, have you executed your commission? Yes, Capitan, returned Carlini. At nine o'clock tomorrow, Rita's father will be here with the money. It is well in the meantime. We will have a merry night. This young girl is charming and does credit to your taste. Now, as I am not egotistical, we will return to our comrades and draw lots for her. You have determined, then, to abandon her to the common law, said Carlini. Why should an exception be made in her favour? I thought that my entreaties... What right have you, any more than the rest, to ask for an exception? It is true. But never mind, continued Cucciumetto, laughing. Sooner or later your turn will come. Carlini's teeth clinched convulsively. Now then, said Cucciumetto, advancing toward the other bandits, are you coming? I follow you. Cucciumetto departed without losing sight of Carlini for doubtless he feared lest he should strike him unawares, but nothing betrayed a hostile design on Carlini's part. He was standing, his arms folded near Rita, who was still insensible. Cucciumetto fancied for a moment the young man was about to take her in his arms and fly, but this mattered little to him now, Rita had been his, and as for the money, three hundred piastres, distributed among the band was so small a sum that he cared little about it. He continued to follow the path to the glade. But to his great surprise, Carlini arrived almost as soon as himself. Let us draw lots, let us draw lots, cried all the brigands when they saw the chief. Their demand was fair, and the chief inclined his head in sign of acquiescence. The eyes of all shone fiercely as they made their demand, and the red light of the fire made them look like demons. The names of all, including Carlini, were placed in a hat, and the youngest of the band drew forth a ticket. The ticket bore the name of Diavolaccio. He was the man who had proposed to Carlini the health of their chief, and to whom Carlini replied by breaking the glass across his face. A large wound extending from the temple to the mouth was bleeding profusely. Diavolaccio, seeing himself thus favoured by fortune, burst into a loud laugh. "'Captain,' said he, 
Just now, Carlini would not drink your health when I proposed it to him. Propose mine to him and let us see if he will be more condescending to you than to me. Everyone except an explosion on Carlini's part. But to their great surprise, he took a glass in one hand and a flask in the other and filling it. Your health, Diabaraccio, said he calmly, and he drank it off, without his hand trembling in the least. Then sitting down by the fire, My supper, said he. My expedition has given me an appetite. Well done, Carlini, cried the brigands. That is acting like a good fellow. And they all formed a circle round the fire, while Diavolaccio disappeared. Carlini ate and drank as if nothing had happened. The bandits looked on with astonishment at this singular conduct, until they heard footsteps. They turned around and saw Diavolaccio bearing the young girl in his arms. Her head hung back and her long hair swept the ground. As they entered the circle, the bandits could perceive by the firelight the unearthly pallor of the young girl and of Diavolaccio. This apparition was so strange and so solemn that everyone rose, with the exception of Carlini, who remained seated and ate and drank calmly. Diavolaccio advanced amidst the most profound silence and laid Rita at the captain's feet. Then everyone could understand the cause of the unearthly pallor in the young girl and the bandit. A knife was plunged up to the hilt in Rita's left breast. Everyone looked at Carlini. The sheath at his belt was empty. Ah, said the chief, I now understand why Carlini stayed behind. All savage natures appreciate a desperate deed. No other of the bandits would, perhaps, have done the same. But they all understood what Carlini had done. Now then, cried Carlini, rising in his turn and approaching the corpse, his hand on the butt of one of his pistols. Does anyone dispute the possession of this woman with me? No, returned the chief. She is thine. Carlini raised her in his arms, and carried her out of the circle of firelight. Cuchumato placed his sentinels for the night, and the bandits wrapped themselves in their cloaks, and lay down before the fire. At midnight the sentinel gave the alarm, and in an instant all were on the alert. It was Rita's father, who brought his daughter's ransom in person. Here, said he to Cuchumato, here are the three hundred piastres. Give me back my child. But the chief, without taking the money, made a sign to him to follow. The old man obeyed. They both advanced beneath the trees, through whose branches streamed the moonlight. Cuchumato stopped at last, and pointed to two persons grouped at the foot of a tree. There, said he, Demand thy child of Carlini. He will tell thee what has become of her. And he returned to his companions. The old man remained motionless. He felt that some great and unforeseen misfortune hung over his head. At length, he advanced toward the group, the meaning of which he could not comprehend. As he approached, Carlini raised his head and the forms of two persons became visible to the old man's eyes. A woman lay on the ground, her head resting on the knees of a man who was seated by her. As he raised his head, the woman's face became visible. The old man recognized his child, and Carlini recognized the old man. "'I expected thee,' said the bandit to Rita's father. "'Wretch,' returned the old man, what hast thou done? And he gazed with terror on Rita, pale and bloody, a knife buried in her bosom. A ray of moonlight poured through the tree and lighted up the face of the dead. Cuchumato had violated thy daughter, said the bandit. I loved her, therefore I slew her, for she would have served as the sport of the whole band. The old man spoke not, and grew pale as death. Now, 
continued Carlini. If I have done wrongly, avenge her. And withdrawing the knife from the wound in Rita's bosom, he held it out to the old man with one hand, while with the other he tore open his vest. Thou hast done well, returned the old man in a hoarse voice. Embrace me, my son. Carlini threw himself, sobbing like a child, into the arms of his mistress's father. These were the first tears the man of blood had ever wept. Now, said the old man, aid me to bury my child. Carlini fetched two pickaxes, and the father and the lover began to dig at the foot of a huge oak, beneath which the young girl was to repose. When the grave was formed, the father kissed her first and then the lover afterwards, one taking the head, the other the feet. They placed her in the grave. Then they knelt on each side of the grave and said the prayers of the dead. Then, when they had finished, they cast the earth over the corpse until the grave was filled. Then, extending his hand, the old man said, I thank you, my son, and now leave me alone. Yet, replied Carlini, Leave me, I command you. Carlini obeyed, rejoined his comrades, folded himself in his cloak, and soon appeared to sleep as soundly as the rest. It had been resolved the night before to change their encampment. An hour before daybreak, Cuchumeto aroused his men and gave the word to march. But Carlini would not quit the forest without knowing what had become of Rita's father, he went toward the place where he had left him. He found the old man, suspended from one of the branches of the oak which shaded his daughter's grave. He then took an oath of bitter vengeance over the dead body of the one and the tomb of the other. But he was unable to complete his oath, for two days afterwards, in an encounter with the Roman cabineers, Carlini was killed. There was some surprise, however, that as he was with his face to the enemy, he should have received a ball between his shoulders. That astonishment ceased when one of the brigands remarked to his comrades that Cuchometto was stationed ten paces in Carlini's rear when he fell. On the morning of the departure from the forest of Frosinone, he had followed Carlini in the darkness and heard this oath of vengeance and, like a wise man, anticipated it. They told ten other stories of this bandit chief, each more singular than the other. Thus, from Fondi to Perusia, everyone trembles at the name of Cuchumetto. These narratives were frequently the theme of conversation between Luigi and Teresa. The young girl trembled very much at hearing the stories, but Vampa reassured her with a smile, tapping the butt of his good fowling piece, which threw its ball so well, and if that did not restore her courage, he pointed to a crow, perched on some dead branch, took aim, touched the trigger, and the bird fell dead at the foot of the tree. Time passed on, and the two young people had agreed to be married when Vampa should be twenty and Teresa nineteen years of age. They were both orphans and had only their employer's leave to ask, which had been already sought and obtained. One day, when they were talking over their plans for the future, they heard two or three reports of firearms, and then suddenly a man came out of the wood, near which the two young persons used to graze their flocks, and hurried towards them. When he came within hearing, he exclaimed, I am pursued, can you conceal me? They knew full well that this fugitive must be a bandit, but there is an innate sympathy between the Roman brigand and the Roman peasant, and the latter is always ready to aid the former. Vampa, without saying a word, hastened to the stone that closed up the entrance to their grotto, drew it away, made a sign to the fugitive to take refuge there in a retreat unknown to everyone, closed the stone upon him, and then went and resumed his seat by Teresa. Instantly afterwards, four cabiniers on horseback appeared on the edge of the wood. Three of them appeared to be looking for the fugitive, while the fourth dragged a brigand prisoner by the neck. 
The three cabiniers looked about carefully on every side, so the young peasants and galloping up began to question them. They had seen no one. That is very annoying, said the brigadier, for the man we are looking for is the chief. Cuchumeto, cried Luigi and Teresa at the same moment. Yes, sir, replied the brigadier, and as his head is valued at a thousand Roman crowns, there would have been five hundred for you if you had helped us to catch him. The two young persons exchanged looks. The brigadier had a moment's hope. Five hundred crowns are three thousand lira, and three thousand lira are a fortune for two poor orphans who are going to be married. Yes, it is very annoying, said Vamba, but we have not seen him. Then the cabriniers scoured the country in different directions, but in vain. Then after a time they disappeared. Vampa then removed the stone, and Cuchumeto came out. Through the crevices in the granite, he had seen the two young peasants talking with the cabiniers, and guessed the subject of their parley. He had read in the countenances of Luigi and Teresa their steadfast resolution not to surrender him, and he drew from his pocket a purse full of gold, which he offered to them. But Vampa raised his head proudly. As to Teresa... Her eyes sparkled when she thought of all the fine gowns and gay jewellery she could buy with this purse of gold. Cuchumato was a cunning fiend, and had assumed the form of a brigand instead of a serpent, and this look from Teresa showed to him that she was a worthy daughter of Eve, and he returned to the forest, pausing several times on his way, under the pretext of saluting his protectors. Several days elapsed, and they neither saw nor heard of Cuchumato. The time of the carnival was at hand. The Count of San Felice announced a grand masked ball, to which all that were distinguished in Rome were invited. Teresa had a great desire to see this ball. Luigi asked permission of his protector, the steward, that she and he might be present amongst the servants of the house. This was granted. The ball was given by the Count for the particular pleasure of his daughter Carmela, whom he adored. Carmela was precisely the age and figure of Teresa, and Teresa was as handsome as Carmela. On the evening of the ball, Teresa was attired in her best, her most brilliant ornaments in her hair and gayest glass beads. She was in the costume of the women of Frascati. She wore the very picturesque garb of the Roman peasant at holiday time. They both mingled, as they had leave to do, with the servants and the peasants. The festa was magnificent, but only was the villa brilliantly illuminated, but the thousands of colored lanterns were suspended from the trees in the garden, and very soon the palace overflowed to the terraces and the terraces to the garden walks. At each cross-path was an orchestra, and tables spread with refreshments the guests stopped, formed quadrilles, and danced in any part of the grounds they pleased. Carmela was attired like a woman of Sonino, her cap was embroidered with pearls. The pins in her hair were of gold and diamonds. Her girdle was of turkey silk with large embroidered flowers. Her bodice and skirt were of cashmere. Her apron of Indian muslin, and the buttons of her corset were of jewels. Two of her companions were dressed, the one as a woman of Nettuno, and the other as a woman of La Riccia. Four young men of the richest and noblest families of Rome accompanied them with that Italian freedom which has not its parallel in any other country in the world. They were attired as peasants of Albano, Velletri, Civita Castellana, and Sora. We need hardly add that these peasant costumes, like those of the young women, were brilliant with gold and jewels. Carmela wished to form a quadrille, but there was one lady wanting. Carmela looked all round her, but not one of the guests had a costume similar to her own, or those of her companions. The Count of San Felice pointed out Teresa, who was hanging on Luigi's arm in a group of peasants. "'Will you allow me, father?' said Carmela. "'Certainly,' replied the Count. "'Are we not in carnival time?' Carmela turned towards a young man, who was talking with her and saying a few words to him, pointed with her finger to Teresa. The young man looked, bowed in obedience, 
and then went to Teresa and invited her to dance in a quadrille directed by the Count's daughter. Teresa felt a flush pass over her face. She looked at Luigi, who could not refuse his assent. Luigi slowly relinquished Teresa's arm, which she had held beneath his own, and Teresa, accompanied by her elegant cavalier, took her appointed place with much agitation in the aristocratic quadrille. Certainly, in the eyes of an artist, the exact and strict costume of Teresa had a very different character from that of Carmela and her companions, and Teresa was frivolous and coquettish, and thus the embroidery and muslins, the cashmere waist girdles, all dazzled her, and the reflection of sapphires and diamonds almost turned her giddy brain. Luigi felt a sensation, hitherto unknown, arising in his mind. It was like an acuter pain, which gnawed at his heart, and then thrilled through his whole body. He followed with his eye each movement of Teresa and her cavalier. When their hands touched, 